younger ones. And um, oh, there's welcome to everybody who's here, both online and in the rooms. And we'll start with, um, I need to know if there's are any additions or deletions to the agenda from the board members. Okay, seeing none, then um, at this time, um, I'd like a motion to adopt the, no, we don't need to, we've already got the agenda, sorry. All right, um, at this time, we have our first time for public comment. Uh, is an opportunity for folks in the um, in the room that are not board members to make um, comments. We ask that you try to keep it to three minutes. Um, and are uh, there people here who would like to make a comment? Yes, Mark. My name is Mark Weinstein. I have a prepared statement because I am not comfortable speaking in front of adults in public, kids in blind with, mm -hmm. my time to carry, so it shouldn't take more than three minutes if that's what you're giving me. Yes. Uh, okay. From the March 27th edition of the Mountain Times, MVSU's Board Collector Voter Surveys, which is the title, uh, the board, quote unquote, the board is in listening mode, the board said. We're really hoping to get new ideas from the respondents. However, past actions of some members of the board staff seem to contradict this statement. This has to be a joint process with community members and taxpayers so they feel that they are really being heard and not just attending the infomercials that the board presented in the months leading up to town meeting day. In a February 15, 2024 email to the MBSU Director of Technology and Innovation, School Superintendent, Director of Finance and Operations, as well as the board chair, the board vice chair writes, quote, Rob, Good seeing you on more morning walks to West. Is it possible to block particular email addresses? This group has become abusive in their interactions with school staff and board members, having long ago exhausted the university legitimate questions. They're now just lobbing baseless allegations and across the line into name calling and insults. I'd like to shut down their ability to email me directly. Could you please block or let me know how to block the following senders? Unquote. On the same morning, Sherry Souza emailed Ben Ford and CC Raphael Adonik, if that's pronunciation is right, Kerry Bristow and James Finn writing, quote, agree. Thank you, Rob. Take care and be well. Later that morning, Raphael Adonik emailed Sherry Souza with a CC to Ben Ford, Kerry Bristow, and James Finn writing, I spoke to Sherry and she requested that we block emails from those folks for all our mountainviews.org users, so I've done that, unquote. In a follow-up interview with Valley News reporter the day before town meeting day, the vice chair said that the MVSU blocked nine individuals from emailing board members and school officials due to hostile and threatening content. The vice chair then showed some of these emails or shared some of these emails with the Valley News reporter. After I contacted the Valley News reporter, she stated that the most inflammatory quote that she found was, quote, these people are crazy, unquote. She then left it up to readers to decide whether that quote rises to the level of threat or hostility. She noted that she was writing about the bond voting and reporting that the discourse around it had become contentious as town meeting day approached. Evidence of contention was that the school board decided to block emails. She didn't get into an analysis of whether the decision had merit, just that it happened. As for herself, she noted that no journalist is going to favor random blocking of the public from communicating with public officials. I just have one last card to touch on. As for why the vote failed, the answer is pretty simple. 1,570 yes votes, 45.11%, and 1,910 no votes, 54.89%. Although the fiscal 25, fiscal year 25 budget passed with 2,115 yes and 1,300 no votes, 610 more voters voted no on the bond issue. This represents an increase of 46.92% more no votes for the bond issue, Article 7, 
than for the school district budget, Article 6. Thank you for letting me give that input. Thank you, Mark. Is there anyone else for public comment? Yes. Hi. Hi, I'm BSU board members. My name is Katie Stiles, and my husband Kevin and I are the parents to a sweet, smart, funny, and kind little boy named Henry. Through the Act 166 program, Henry has attended KES for the last two years of school in Ms. Gerber's classroom. Both Henry and our family have loved our time at KES and formed strong bonds with his fellow classmates, KES families, the teachers, and the Killington community at large. As residents of Stockbridge, Henry's time at KES is currently being funded via the Act 166 program and by two tuition paid directly by us and BSU. Henry is slated to attend Stockbridge Elementary School for kindergarten next year, but we would like for him to continue at Killington and would like to pay a parental tuition to cover his attendance. We are asking the board to consider amending the 2016 policy on parental tuition at KES. Our home is uniquely positioned in an area that shows up as Pittsfield on Google Maps. It is at the end of a road that is designated as Pittsfield up until about 400 yards from our property line, and Henry has classmates that live less than a quarter of a mile from us and go to KES through Pittsfield's school choice program. From our home, there is no way for us to reach any part of Stockbridge without driving through Pittsfield. Our mailing address is in Pittsfield, and we are two working parents who own and operate three businesses, all located in Pittsfield. As we started our research into this inquiry, we spoke with the Vermont AOE, who explained there was no state mandate about tuitioning into elementary school. Rather, it was a district by district decision. We know you're all heavily invested in the budget and success of the district schools and are hopeful parental tuition can provide an opportunity to offset some of the proposed tax burden the district is currently facing. My husband and I truly believe that a few yards of geographical anomaly don't outweigh the academic benefits and exceptional growth we've seen in Henry as a result of his time at KES. We are hopeful the board will consider an exception and allow for tuition to continue with Henry's experience at Killington. He truly does love it there and loves his friends and teachers. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Katie. I think that um, will be discussed at a later time. Thank you. All right, we have a report from the superintendent. But I believe somebody else is going to give it. Yes, I, you're going to hear a lot from me with the annual report. So I asked uh, Assistant Principal Cody Tancredi to speak about um, his program that uh, the work he's been doing at the middle school and high school. Yeah. Uh, if you would mind. Oh, do you want me to come up here? Sure. <laughs> they don't bite off. Yeah. And it's early in the I know these, these owls. Yeah. The All right. Um, so I'm going to talk specifically about some of the work we've done in our middle school throughout the year. And I want to just be clear that this isn't work that is a one time drop in activity, but more of this is who we are striving to be. And uh, we have a really talented staff who've worked hard to embed these things into our curriculum and um, make it a part of our normal practice. Just wanted to make that clear before I start talking about these. And I actually don't really need my notes because it's such great work. Um, I'm really excited about it. We've had forced behavioral incidents that happen throughout the year. Um, related to all sorts of topics some are, are easy you know minor behaviors others are a little harder and we have to really dive into what that work looks like um, certain topics related to equity dehumanizing language how we treat each other those things come up and because of the great work we're doing embedding things into our curriculum lessons activities we're trying to be that proactive lane rather than always this reactive approach of what do we do when an incident occurs. So some of the things that we've done this year um, in our middle school specifically are our SEL teachers, Lori Smith specifically, has gone into classrooms and, and taught lessons to students about how we treat each other, about friendship, um, uh, character lessons and wellness in our wellness programs just about character. We've done many restorative circles within advisory around multiple topics in our middle school. Some are following events. Others are, again, that proactive lane of this is who we're, we're trying to be and really trying to focus on those topics of empathy, kindness, respect, and how we treat each other in our middle school. Um, we, we have certain groups. Tom Emery and I work with a group of students. We talk a lot about leadership and uh, life skills we've worked with our middle school team to with ideas about who do we bring in when, when there are major events we had a professional dr labelle brown that came in recently 
um, and worked with all of our middle school students and all of our middle school staff for two days around empathy, kindness, respect, history, the context of our language that we use and the impact that that can have on on others. Um, and I got to say that it was really, really successful experience. And I got to uh, observe those lessons with our students and their buy in that was incredible. They were partic fully participating in every activity. And by the end of it, they were you know, shaking Dr. Brown's hand as they were walking out saying, thank you for, for the message that you gave today. Um, and I actually kept a lot of those notes for the feedback they gave Dr. Brown was pretty eye opening. But again, so Dr. Brown, when he was there, our teachers were able to work in that with quadrant, really trying to work with our staff about what did you want to get out of this experience with Dr. Brown? So they they asked that he come in and observe some lessons that they've been working on that include um, topics around race and equity. And he gave feedback on, on their performance and they were able to talk about, hey, how do I improve this lesson? What's, what's a good idea for this? Um, they had drop-in sessions where they could come in and just check in with them about maybe future lessons. Um, how do I handle this situation? Um, overall, really great couple days with Dr. Brown. But the work, like I said, continues. And this week is Live Your Life Week. And our middle school students have planned the entire thing. It's all student-led through our middle school QSA. And I got to attend one of those sessions this morning with approximately 20 middle schoolers in my group. It was student-led and they answered questions that were, according to Dr. Brown, we're trying to dive into that little bit deeper culture. Um, if we know this about you, we will be less likely to say these words that might impact you. So if we know each other, right, we connect, uh, and that's where we're trying to go with this. So, a student in my group today asked many questions and we went around in a restorative circle approach and they were able to give um, answers to those or pass and it was just a really great experience for me to sit back and kind of watch these amazing students we have lead such a, a hard topic and that was happening in every classroom in our middle school today at noon for 25 minutes and they have planned the entire week for that 25 minute block with all of our students um, so that's just a snapshot of just the work in our middle school this year. And there's probably many, many things that I'm, I'm missing, um, but the work is embedded into what we do every day. And that's really important. I wanted to leave that message out there. This isn't just a response. This is who we're trying to be. Who we are, so. okay. Thank you. Do you have any questions for yeah. questions? Please feel free to ask a question. Is the data showing any decrease in referrals or disciplinary infections? I know you did this awesome presentation last year. Yeah, so um, interestingly enough, our highest data point right now is class skips in the high school. We've done some really great work with our high school teachers around class skips and, and what's our universal steps going to be um, to that and working with them to come up with those ideas. The the major behaviors that may you know relate to HHB, if that's kind of where you're going, that question like a a major behavior related to race equity, uh, dehumanizing language, that type of behavior, we have seen a decrease. Does it not exist in our school? No, it does exist. But I think that our responses have improved greatly, um, and I'm confident in our responses as a team at school. I would be able to answer. Happy to share data anytime, but it's yeah, class skips are way, way up there. Anybody else have a question? To the work that you were doing with the middle school, mm -hmm. uh, is it the same for seven, eight, yep. or is it? And then, um, how do you see that continuing on through the upper grades as they continue on? A great question, and that was something that we talked a lot about with those two days with. Dr. Brown was how do we continue this work? Um, and some of the things that came up is just knowing what's happening in our middle school, um, being really open with that communication about here's what's happening in seventh grade, here's what we're focusing on in eighth grade, how do you continue that? Um, putting work out in hallways, uh, transitions like we were doing for our sixth graders to come to our seventh grade, we're working on, we're gonna have our our eighth graders go to our, our ninth grade advisories and meet their advisors. 
eighth grade is going to go do a, a walkthrough of all their ninth grade teachers and get a little presentation by the end of the year uh, building those connections but yes I, the goal would be that that work continues um, and aligns with our portrait of graduate and our FD work that we're doing we're really aligned with that policy we're trying to put that policy in place in our school anybody else Oh, correct. What's QSA? What's the mouth of QSA? Was that for that? Yeah, we have others. Uh, yeah. They're not an outstanding group of students. Uh, they are driven, respectful. They've met with me probably 10 times about the questions that they're going to ask to make sure that everyone's going to get comfortable in these situations. Um, they've done an outstanding job. I can't give them enough credit. And the two advisors. Any Luke and Aaron, Aaron. Thank you, Paul. Awesome. Thank, yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, so nice to hear those encouraging reports. Yeah. All right. And next we have the directors. Let's get my book here ready. Uh, starting with the director of technology and innovation, Raf. Good evening, everyone. Um, two pieces I'd like to update you on tonight. Um, I'm excited to announce that we've uh, secured a vendor for our firewall RFP. Um, so we'll be um, contracting with uh, a company out of Berlin, Vermont, uh, called Ormsby's Computer Systems um, to upgrade firewalls in all of our schools and our district locations. Um, this is a big project. Firewalls are really essential pieces of equipment. They separate our internal network from the outside world and vice versa. Um, so it's really important that we have um, up-to-date firewalls with good service contracts. Um, this contract is, is for five years with all the um, licensing for that period as well. So we're taking advantage of the last pieces of our ESSER money in order to cover that and to position us for the next five years to be put on that front. Um, so we're very excited about that. And the other piece I wanted to share was um, many of you parents may have seen um, students may have seen the, the Quaglia surveys that went out. Um, so we spent some time um, analyzing that data. This is the second year that we've done those surveys. Uh, so we now have a point of comparison and we can look at what's changed from year to year, um, what's going up, what's going down, and how um, different things are, are looking in different schools. So um, our school leadership team spent some time looking at that data uh, recently, and we're going to continue to look at that and understand the deployment in our schools. So just want to let you know that the data that you all submitted is being looked at and informing some good discussions. Great. Thank you. Does anybody have a question for Raph? I will say Raph saved me from my spread. I thought I could do this analysis very quickly. So while we realize Claudia is great in terms of themes, they align with our portrait of graduate, and they're consistent themes between the teacher, parent, and student group. The data analysis is well beyond my special education scope and graph saved me with three days of spreadsheets and analysis and I just want to thank them. It looks much better and much more informing than what I could ever do. So you did a great job of that. Thank you, Raph. And all the principals are expected to have action steps as a result of their individual schools that they'll present at the next leadership team meeting from, resulting from that survey. Great. Uh, the next report is from Shana Kalnitsky, the Director of Student Support Services. Good evening. In addition, to, oops, sorry, should I not start yet? No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, in addition to the notes that I provided for the board book, I, I always like to highlight um, a few things from the department. And as Raf was talking about the Quaglia survey, I will add that uh, in addition to principals having an action plan, our department will also consider the feedback from the Quaglia study uh, as we look forward to what we're doing uh, with our students. One of the uh, topics that we've been looking at this week, I met with, or this month, I met with Meg Roylance, our um, occupational therapist in the district, and uh, who's also a parent in the district. And we talked about assistive technology for our students, and it's something that we have available. Uh, highlights of those assistive technology programs are Learning Ally, which is like an online library, but it's not only trade books, it's also student textbooks. 
So if we think about how do students who have a reading disability access the literature opportunities in school, this is one vehicle that we can use to do it. Font size, font color, background color, the ability to change the speed that the text is read to students is adjustable. We also have something called Read Write, which is a text to speech technology. It's predictive, it helps students take digital notes. Uh, it can help them write outlines with uh, a related service provider and then take it to their English class. And we realized that not only do we want students to be able to utilize these tools more independently, but we want educators to have more knowledge of how they work so they can be integrated into regular education classrooms uh, and more accessible to these students. So we're going to be continuing to not only include them in students daily use, but teach more educators how to use these tools effectively to support their students in class. We have also had an increase in opportunities for special educators, interventionists, and general education educators to partner to find access points and analyze data and create successful learning paths for our students. And a great example of this is Marsha Brown, who is a reading interventionist in the middle school and high school. And she provides literacy assessments so we can understand some of our students better. And these would be students who are not eligible for special education, but everybody else in the building. And she then analyzes the data and reviews it with the general education teachers and the team at the middle school and high school. And she's partnered with all the educators there to help design instruction and also create opportunities for those students to be more successful in their classes. And I'd also like to commend the special education team because after COVID, you know, we had this big bubble of students who had been referred to special education three years ago. And we are in the home stretch of completing almost 70 special education reevaluations. And thanks to counselors, special educators, psychologists, related service providers, the principals, the classroom teachers, this is no small undertaking, especially with a brand new school psychologist this year and several new special educators. And this was really good work to evaluate the progress that our students had made and so exciting to then design new instructional plans for these students and continue to monitor their success. Thank you, Shana. Are there any questions for Shana? <clears throat> all right, thanks for all you do. Uh, next, we have the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Hi, everyone. Jennifer Settle, Director of the CIA. Uh, I get to share with you some exciting work that's happening with our teachers right now, um, all of which, interestingly, is grant funded. Um, so first of all, we're planning ahead to next summer. We have one foot this year, one foot next year, one foot in the summer three feet, I guess. Um, and a lot of our work that happens during the summer is very important for helping the school year run successfully in our classrooms. So we try to provide stipends for groups of teachers to work. And so those stipends come with um, time to collaborate, essentially. But all of that takes a lot of organization. So we're advertising to teachers opportunities to collaborate on literacy and math topics. And um, we're gathering groups and uh, getting all of that organized for the summer. Um, we also have a group that's going to be planning next year's in-service days. I don't know if you've noticed, but our in-service days next year are in October and November. But we don't have a March in-service day. So those days are going to be focused on data. Our teachers are going to be looking at student data in October, making plans for how they can help their students implementing those plans, and then reanalyzing in November. And they're going to be doing it collaboratively. And so we have a group that's going to be working over the summer to figure out what those in-service days look like. So we have some stipends for that work as well. Um, we have a math curriculum pilot design team that's just starting up. Um, the current math curriculum we're using is no longer going to be published and is a little bit outdated. So we are considering new curricular products that we can use. And before we can even consider what to use, we have to design a whole process to do it well. So we have a group of teachers coming together right now to design a pilot. That's some great work that's happening. 
Um, we also have a report card refinement team. An elementary report card is being redone. Um, and we have some iterations out there that we've received initial feedback on, but we need more. So we have a group of teachers we're gathering right now so that we can do quicker, faster iterations to try and get that refined. I'm also traveling to each PTO at the elementary school and meeting with those PTO groups to gather some family feedback about what you find meaningful in report cards. So if you, um, to anyone here tonight, if you have any ideas about what you'd like to see on an elementary report card that would make the one we have right now much better, please contact your PTO reps and give them that information and they'll be sharing that with me. Um, and uh, then finally, um, we're continuing our middle school strategic plan work, again, grant funded. Um, it's been a year long process where we are developing um, action plans for improvement in our middle school. Um, that the middle school teachers are developing alongside with me, and then we'll be passing those strategies on to our new principal and um, beginning that work next year. Thank you. Are there any questions for Jen? I have a question. Uh, Can y'all hear me? Yes. Brilliant. Hey, Jen. Um, I haven't seen an elementary school report card in quite a bit, um, but tying into um, Mr. Tancredi's work, I wonder if we have, if it isn't already on there, um, some social emotional scores um, so that we can track, um, you know, the development of empathy and um, uh, collaboration and leadership and all that through the school years starting in elementary school. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think it would be um, really interesting to look at our portrait of a graduate and see if any of the components we built into there is captured there, because we are considering adding the portrait of a graduate components to the report card. And I do believe some of the sub subcategories include empathy. Mm -hmm. So thinking about how what that would look like in the classroom and how we could assess it, and then how we would capture that on a report card would be the important step that this group would have to figure out. Um, we do have an empathy mm -hmm. aspect to the mm -hmm. new version of mm -hmm. the POG. So that's already a part of what we're planning to add, hopefully. Awesome. Um, awesome. But still looking for some feedback from everyone. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Jen. Yeah. And uh, we have a report from the Director of Finance and Operations, uh, Mr. Jim Fenn. Good evening. Um, I sent you, I included uh, links to updates on um, where we are with our budget spending. Uh, one of the things that I'm really happy to see is we're really using our new software properly now. And, you know, we've spent 40%, but we've been encumbered another 45%. So we're using it as a planning tool and it's actually working. And we're, uh, we have a much better idea of where we are with our budget at any point in time. So that's a big improvement. Um, Green Mountain Power has been here off and on for the last 10 days, bringing wires across to our parking lot and hooking it up to the transformers. So we are ready for the last step, which is to install the chargers so we can start running our school buses with the blue bumpers. So watch for them after April vacation. They will be on the road. Awesome. And then tomorrow, as part of our investigating and in how to address some of the things brought up um, as a result of the um, vote on the new building. Uh, Joe and I are meeting several board members and working with the contract, the architect, and our owner's rep and doing a walkthrough of the current middle high school um, to look at what a renovation of that building would be, what it would cost, and then we can have answers because the answers that we have right now are based on something that was done seven years ago, six mm -hmm. years ago. And so um, they're old. I don't think I don't think a lot of the ideas are any different, but the, the prices are certainly five years old and uh, we wanted to update that. So we had better answers when we were asked questions about renovation. So we will be doing that and asking uh, PC Construction to uh, put together some pricing for us. What are the averages? Sorry. Uh, tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. So, yeah, we're trying to be a, a smaller group as we can easily be and not be too disruptive to what's going on in the school. But uh, we have two or three board members that are joining us. And, uh, yeah. 
Any questions for Jim? All right, thank you very much. And from our student board member, Owen, it's going to bridge the two reports yeah. that are in our packet. Yeah, I'm going to do my best to uh, dutifully follow Aiden's words and then I'll throw in some of mine. So he's at the cross. Um, the SAT, uh, which is all net digital now, so new and improved, was uh, taken by our high school students on the 20th of March. So uh, mainly juniors, it's great that we offer that free for juniors. I think that's an incredible um, opportunity for all of our kids. Um, and uh, it was it was all digital. You wanted to thank the teachers and administrators who helped students prepare. I'm thinking um, Heather Veneta and Lauren Sullivan Justice who offered an SAT prep course. So uh, thank you to them and thank you to the administrators that facilitated the test. Um, AP exams are also coming up in the next few weeks. Preseason for high school spring sports has officially started. Well, real season has officially started now. Um, and many teams are doing scrimmages and things like that, and that will lead them into their uh, the bulk of their season in the next few weeks. Um, near the end of March, we welcome students from our exchange trip or our exchange program with uh, Bavaria, Germany. So they were doing a fast program. Uh, we had, I think, um, a number of students. So I'm not sure, maybe a half dozen students in our high school for a few days, um, and that was great. They got an opportunity to explore our region and our program and, and interact with our students. So that was a cool opportunity. Um, and then as for our language based exchange program, some of the French uh, exchange students have left. They're in Paris now. So uh, that's exciting. And then kids going to Madrid will be leaving in the next few weeks. Um, this past week, um, students filled out student voice surveys, uh, those Baglia, Baglia surveys. Um, and uh, Aiden's Code of Conduct working group, I think, um, met and, and kept uh, chipping away at the, the, uh, the document there. Um, and uh, our Student Leadership Summit logistics were, were set. So we, uh, we signed a contract. We're in good shape for that. We've got to pick the menu. <laughs> it's really important. Coffee bar, pastries. <laughs> Chocolate cake. Critical. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'll say, you know, very recently there's been buzz I've heard from multiple students um, in my grade, I'm a junior, about the idea of junior privileges. So we have senior privileges uh, where our seniors are allowed to uh, leave campus if they have time and, and they can go, you know, maybe off into farmers, <laughs> support a local business for lunch. Um, so I think, you know, selfishly, my friends and I, <laughs> Are, are interested in that idea. So maybe that's an issue for the policy committee, but um, that, that came up recently and I thought I would bring it up. And uh, today, uh, our students signed up for Earth Day activities in the next few weeks. I know I will be doing some sustainable vegan uh, muffins. So very excited for that. Um, that's another cool tradition of ours. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Owen and Aiden. And Aiden. Very good. Uh, at this time, we're going to move into our time schedule appointments. First is the annual report from our superintendent, Sherry sure. Sosa. And Raph, if you would join us, and Raph's going to help me with some of the slides. Again, he's my much clearer and much more fluid in describing some of the information here. So I'm going to share my screen. And before I launch into uh, this policy required activity, I think it's really important to um, for me to say that this you were is talking really... to a kid named Matt. You were talking to someone. Oh, weren't you just getting fucking pissy at fucking Iona for hitting on your Hi, fucking? Marina. Thank you, Marina. All right, and there's that. So I just wanted to share. So this is a board required policy to have an annual report around the strategic plan, as well as some other aspects of um, the work we do. Um, we begin preparation for the annual report in January. Uh, myself, Raina, other members of the leadership team are all involved in collecting the information. What I really want to say is this annual report is not about central office. This annual report is about the work that happens in our schools every day, the commitment and passion of our faculty, our willingness and availability of our students, 
Um, it's a time I, you know, I want to be in the classroom more. I hear feedback from teachers. We want to see you in schools more. Um, when I see the body of work, it is just so exciting to bring together these statistics and to present it to you. Um, I think back to when we merged and all the Act 46 meetings we had, and there's a few left to participate in that. There was really an emphasis that each campus maintained a unique personality. And I think that comes through really clearly in this annual report. Each campus, um, all of our elementary schools, middle school, and high school have their unique flavor specific to the communities they live in, the resources they have, and the faculty and leadership at each building. So um, this is an opportunity for me to share the work of our buildings and to celebrate the progress we've made and also to recognize the work that's continued to need to happen. So I thought this year of all years, uh, let's put the middle school on our front slide. We've had elementary for a number of years. This is our proud and exciting eighth grade team uh, on the top of Mount Tom at the start of the school year. Mm -hmm. um, also to note, this is year five of our strategic plan. I never thought we'd get here and we're here now. So uh, this is the last time we will be reporting out on this document. So uh, within this presentation, we have a message from our board chairs. We'll look for one last time at the original portrait of a graduate. Um, I have some graduate profiles that I'd like to highlight. I think it's important to note where our students leave, go after they finish with us. Um, there's some recognitions of success, both with our students and our faculty. The board has highlights of work they've done. Um, going through each of the strategic plan goals, um, looking at student success, learning environment, community alliances, culture, and foundational systems. Um, I do a strategic plan report card that you can look at. We'll talk about some of the equity work we've done and also some of the summary data and my, finally the superintendent's recommendations. What's important is this is not only a communication tool for us within the district. Um, often when I speak to people who are applying for positions here, they've looked at our um, annual report. Families who move here look at our annual report. So this is really a document that's beyond our district as a tool to communicate what we value and what we're doing. This is our Reading Elementary students. So Carrie, if you just, I bolded some of the things I thought of, but this is Carrie and Ben's letter um, around the work of last year. Yes, yeah, so we had some um, various things that we took note of for um, what was going on in the reading and the, the math instruction the initiatives that were started and the foundational agreements, the um, commitment to try to reach 90% reading proficiency uh, for students in our district. Um, we also approved additional administrative and resources for our elementary schools to address some of the social emotional concerns that we were hearing about uh, from many parents as well as uh, board members. We did replace the roof at Kellington and upgraded the heat system at Woodstock Union High School after the loss of some classrooms due to lack of heat. Um, and we're thankful for the commitment of the board uh, members and of our exceptional administrators and staff and educators. And we, we feel that uh, we're making some progress in addressing some of these um, uh, areas where maybe not as much board attention has been paid in the past. So thank you. Thank you, Kim. Ooh, yeah. oh, there we go. Again, this is the last year of this uh, portrait of a graduate. We've done some revisions, the design team, and worked on this last year. The goals that are currently are uh, areas in each our current um, portrait of a graduate include academic excellence, critical thinking and problem solving, skillful communication, self-direction, and stewardship. And these are the cutest skateboarders I have ever seen. And I'm sorry, I just can't let it go. I'm not a pre-K, uh, early ed kid, but these guys are pretty cool. Yeah. So in terms of some of our graduates, I uh, just wanted to highlight a few graduates that we didn't highlight previously. Jenna Majeski, who graduated from Northeastern and is the second lieutenant in the US Army. Julian Scherting, who um, is currently working for global, global product management for Nike in Oregon. Katie Wexler, who graduated in 2008 and attended Clemson, Clemson University, is currently in the Peace Corps. We had Gordon McMaster, University of Vermont sophomore engineer, and Mike Cupscat when he was in elementary school, mm -hmm. just saying. He was an Eagle Scout. 
Um, and then Hudson Maxim, class of 23, who is um, in the Vermont Registered Apprenticeship Program with uh, St. Cyr Plumbing and Heating. Um, this link also highlights other graduates and the work they've done um, post-graduation from the Stockton High School. In terms of our own district and celebrations, our yearbook was named Jocelyn's 2023 National Yearbook Program of Excellence. We have two teachers who happen to be here tonight, who uh, Andy Wood and Allison Green, who were selected as members of the Equitable Climate Action Partnership Teacher Program. It goes on, but I had to show you. Um, Patty Kelly and Heather Benita taught, uh, did a session at the National Council, Council of Mathematics. Woodstock Elementary was a PBIS School of Distinction. Really important, Woodstock Union High School, AP School Honor Roll Recognition with a Silver Award. Incredibly commendable. The number of kids who are doing AP is just beyond uh, recognition. And two of our own, Aiden and Owen, presented at the Ithaca Diversity and Inclusivity Symposium last summer. It's a lot of fun. And this year we did something new. We really wanted to recognize the seniority of our faculty and staff. And so we provided golden apples for those who have taught in the district for 30 and more years, as well as Will Chamberlain, who has been a custodian of the high school. I think he's had one sick day in those 34 years. Um, Barnard Academy has 30, 30 plus teachers, um, also teachers who uh, have been here for 20 plus years and 10 plus years all received recognition um, on national, International Teacher of the Teacher Day. Good cases. Um, in terms of board highlights, um, the affirm the district goal of 90% proficiency, proficiency in literacy and mathematics by grade three and continuing. We did revise the strategic plan. It was a lot less painful than I thought it was going to be. I appreciate that greatly. Um, we completed some much needed renovations and repairs in our elementary schools, as well as the high school. We approved educational personnel to support a positive climate in our schools. Cody just did a beautiful presentation on that. So policies to further guide the work of the board in many areas, those policies are greatly appreciated by the faculty and staff and administration and I encourage our student board, our school student school board members to take active roles on committees and increase their voice in our meetings by means of a monthly written report. That's a very unique aspect across the state of Vermont. So things to be proud of. And so now we'll go into each of the critical focus areas. First, in terms of student success, um, my highlights that I pull from the data that we received, all students, as Owen said, at Woodstock Union High School had access to the SAT at no cost. 87% of our high school students took more than the required three math classes. That's pretty impressive. Half of our high school students are enrolled in an AP class. Uh, we spoke, speaking to uh, uh, superintendents from our region, we're rare to have as many AP classes, and there are some schools that don't even have AP calculus. Um, so this is something, a real badge of honor. Um, and then the majority of our sophomore class students participate in a career shadow day, uh, which is an opportunity for them to go out in the community, make connections, explore uh, future uh, opportunities. And so these are just some of the data that we look at annually. Um, we had 18 new students inducted into our National Honor Society. Six students are in dual enrollment, so both college and high school. Um, again, the 49% of ninth to 12th grade students are enrolled in one or more AP classes. We have two students who are um, in the early college program. 17 students last year received the seal of biliteracy. Um, and I think it's really important to uh, look at our Woodstock Union High School school profile. So if you click on that link, really gives a, um, a nice description pretty clear what our attributes as a high school, what we have to um, really celebrate in our program. So I encourage people to take a look at that. Um, Ralph, could you speak to this for Ed? Yeah, so one of the uh, pieces that we had in our last strategic plan was looking at how our, our graduates um, do when they leave our school and, and go on to post-secondary education. So in order to look at that data, we, we've partnered or we've subscribed to the National Student Clearinghouse. The National Student Clearinghouse is a consortium, an organization that works with 3,600 um, colleges and post-secondary institutions across the United States and Canada. Um, so what we do is we provide them a list of graduates every year, and they give us data back around who has been enrolled in any post-secondary education, and then over time, who's persisted and how 
how they how they've done. Do they graduate? Do they do they um, drop out at some point? Um, so um, what you see here, this is the, the time that we've had um, multiple years of data. So um, the blue line is just the percentage of students who have enrolled in a college or post-secondary educational opportunity immediately in the fall after high school. We see it by class there. And then um, the red line, which is kind of new, is the, the, the six-year um, graduation rate for those two classes that we have data on. Um, so this is just a helpful sort of lens for us to look at and, and, and for us to understand how um, those students who are deciding to pursue post-secondary education are performing. We, and just, oh, I'm sorry. So if it's going down post COVID, is it there? Is it yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, we can sort of speculate as to sort of why we have some ups and downs there. Um, but yeah, you, you can see that that down for the last few year there. Um, and it also is one of our smallest graduating class. We're only sixty five, as like this year it's about eighty five. So again, when you have such a small end, having a change. But I think what this has really pushed us to think about, and Rath and I had this conversation. And the design team was really clear. How do we design? Uh, how do we describe post-secondary success? Are we really limiting how we have those conversations and how we describe what a student looks like who is successful upon graduation? And I think this is probably the last time we're going to have this data. I think we want to look at a much more broad vision of what it is to be successful after high school. Um, and I think that's something that we want to think about and we want to describe better because um, this is, should not be the only measure of what success is. Um, I and I talk. I have one child who did it for four years, and I have one that never finished. And I think they're both very successful adults. I think we just need to really think about that. There's a lot of things impacting college: the cost, the choices. I think um, high school students are really taking what happens after high school very seriously, or so I that I did at land age, and really thinking about who they want to be what success means for them. And I think that's something we're going to explore some more uh, in the coming years. Other questions about this one? So you have so much better at this data thing. Um, in terms of our learning environment, um, hydronic heating system for the middle of high schools, the new cold roof for Killington Elementary. It was a hot roof and that's why it kept melted all the time. We had all the ice spilled out in the front of the high school. So that's a cold roof. Um, we have design drawings completed for the proposed new middle and high schools. And um, as Jim said, he received three grant funded electronic buses that are parked out front. So here are photographs of the new heating system at the middle school high school. There's that beautiful new roof on Killington and a slide of the design for the proposed middle and high school. In terms of alliances, um, all the elementary schools have diverse connections with their individual communities, and there was evidence of more than 50 community partners at the middle and high schools. Here's just a sampling. Each of the principals submitted a list of the kinds of things that are groups that they are connecting with, um, from VINs to White River Partnership to uh, the Barnard Fire Department, a um, magic show that was sponsored by a WUHS alumni. And there's a lot of different things, photo gallery at Liquid Art. So I think this really highlights how each of our elementaries are keeping their unique perspective in view and really connecting with those around them to support the kind of work they're doing in each of their campuses. And then return of the Thanksgiving dinner at the Prosper Valley and the South Elementary combined. At the middle school and high school, um, you can see the ninth grade has a food security project with Hannaford Markers, it's Upper Valley Haven. Um, we have our continuing and ongoing relationship with Nuvu, who is working with the Northeast Temperate Network of the National Park Service. Um, we also have other work with the Community Service, National Park Service, Thompson Senior Center, Norman Williams Public Library. C3, the Center for Community Connection, is an integral part of our high school, providing experiences beyond our classroom make sure students can explore all kinds of interest areas. That's a live room. I love that photograph. That is so high school. If you can't see yourself in the art, and it really isn't art. So I just, that picture is one of my favorite ones from a visit to the hood um, at Dartmouth. And then craft, you can see again, that rarely unique, um, exciting program that's offered um, by Cat Robbins and Janice Baldwell, where 
students are continuously connecting with a wide variety of resources in our community. In terms of culture, uh, we have our student leadership summit but for the third time with more than 100 participants, 20 from other high schools. So we're really trying to make this leadership summit not specific to just with Dr. Union High School, but high schools across this region. And each elementary school provides unique leadership opportunities for their students. And here's some examples, Prosper Valley, their council uh, opportunities, fifth and sixth grade were there, and their mentoring program for both Woodstock Elementary and Reading Elementary. They have junior librarians, they have fire marshals. Wes has 48 fourth graders participating in the leadership club with the SEL team, the Wildcat Club, and 85 second and third graders students participate in the mentoring program with Prosper Valley. Uh, we had 88 Woodstock Union High School students attend the leadership summit and 20 students from other districts. Uh, these are some statistics that RAF com um, combined in terms of our sports teams. You want to just describe that a little bit? Yeah, so um, policy committee is having some conversations around athletics. Um, and so with the help of um, Sarah Cook from our data team and, and Jack Boimer, we pulled some data just about the number of students who participated <laughs> in sports. I think it's a, it's a very high percentage. I think you'll see um, with 63% of students playing a fall or a winter sport and 32% playing both of those. Spring sports weren't included in this list yet just because the science hadn't occurred when we pulled the data, but we'll certainly include that in coming years. Um, and um, just looking at it, you know, adding a lens of, of equity to look at it as well, looking at the number of economically disadvantaged students who played a sport. Um, versus those who were not economically disadvantaged. It's a lens that we pulled up to look at a lot of our data to make sure that we're making programs that are accessible to all students. And then lastly, just a list of sports and, and, and the participation on um, this past fall. And of course, our state champion girls snowboard team, once again, we have some of the best women snowboarders and our Nordic men's team who are also state champions this winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, foundational systems, um, teachers of reading in grades 7 through 12 for training for knowledge building, comprehension, fluency, and vocabulary. That is not happening anywhere else. Uh, we, Jen just applied for a grant. I know we didn't get the grant because we're doing so much work in terms of literacy. And so the money is going to other districts who aren't doing the heavy lifting we're doing. But that that is really powerful. So this is not just an elementary initiative. This is a full district-wide initiative. And, and, and what's important to the story of attrition, so our level of faculty attrition is at 15% for the last year. Again, in this time and age where teaching is really a challenging experience uh, and can be exhausting quite often, that we are able to keep as many teachers as we do is really a testament to their commitment to our students. Um, other things to recognize, 75% uh, of our faculty either have a master's or PhD, um, I think speaks to our commitment again for professional growth of our teachers, as well as the way the grid has been developed so that we really um, provide opportunities for teachers to receive a master's degree and begin have that advanced training. I think that's really commendable. But you can see the number 86 credit bearing courses for outside of PD opportunities. We mentor 12 teachers, so those were the 12 new teachers this year. Um, I think that we will have less than that this year um, when we'll retain more teachers. Um, we are working better at our formal evaluations. Um, that wasn't as good as we wanted it to be. Um, but you can see 26 teachers of math in grades pre-K through six participated in the math tech training. So that work is comprehensive and across the district. Um, I know Alison, I just, you had so many good pictures, just had to keep pulling them in, sorry. Um, if you click on this, and I'm going to do it really fast, and I hope I even jump back. This is our report card. So because I'm a special educator, I just have to do this. Um, we have every year looked at where we are on every single strategy, whether the work began, was initiated, underway, underway or achieved. I think First, you can notice that there is such a long list of items that we had put on our strategic plan. We didn't do that mistake again. Um, and to note, right smack in the middle of that was COVID. So if you look at this list and you can see how much green and blue is actually in there with these many items to cover in five years with COVID, I'm really proud of how far we got in the work we did. 
um, and that many of the work pieces that we've begun will continue to have in place. So now I'm really hoping that. Yeah. Sorry, I'm gonna have to. I'm not fast enough. All right, I'm gonna go this way and that way, and then come back. Hey. All right, so if you want to look at that more detail, it really shows where we are and all those strategies. And you got to have a picture with a bunch. And I'm sorry, this is one of my favorite pictures because the young man with the ACDC t shirt, and you can't really see it, but that's a John Deere hat. And I'm like, this, this is Vermont, and you've got to love it. All right, so other disparate work. So beyond the strategic plan, there's other work that our team has taken on in terms of equity and racism. And it's really important that we report out on that in a very um, transparent way as well. And I'm gonna ask Raf to talk about the slides again. Yeah, so there's um, two graphs here, and, and I just wanna kind of walk you through what you're seeing here, because there's, there's, there's an interesting story that's being told here. So. Um, when we look at our, our, our academic data, um, we, we want to look at it through the lens of, of, of some of these areas where there are some disparities historically. And, and, and typically we see students receiving pre reduced lunch versus those not receiving pre reduced lunch have some very different academic outcomes. So <laughs> what you'll see, this data was pulled from our STAR data in, in this past winter. Um, so on the left is proficiency. So proficiency, you can think about as sort of like a, a track analogy. It's like the high jump, right? You either clear the bar or you don't. Doesn't tell you how close you are to the bar. Doesn't tell you how much growth you made, how much better you got. It's just, are you over the bar or are you not? Um, and so you can see in that graph, this is a very typical graph, unfortunately, where um, at the law schools, you see where there's really big differences between students receiving previous lunch and their level of proficiency in reading and math and students who don't receive free reduced lunch and their level of proficiency. So this is a very common graph that we see a lot that um, is, is, is a trend for many, many years. Um, the additional piece that I wanted to add this year um, is this idea of growth. So proficiency is, is just that cut measure, but it doesn't measure growth. It doesn't measure whether students are moving towards where we want them to be. Um, and so we're fortunate that the STAR assessments have a measure of growth, um, which is nice because it compares a student to his or her academic peers nationwide. So these, these peers are students in the same grade with similar achievement history. So these are students who've scored similar. And so that means if a student gets 10 more points on an assessment, we're like, is that good or bad? We don't really know. We can look at the growth and say, oh, we can see where that will be in, in terms of a nationwide group of peers. Um, so this is the first time that we've looked at the data in, in this way for growth. And what I hope you, you notice is that there is not a huge difference between students receiving free and reduced lunch and students who don't receive free and reduced lunch. That's, and that's, that's really interesting because a lot of times when we look at those measures, we see differences. Um, so that's one important piece. The other is that you'll notice that both of all of these groups in terms of growth are above 50. So 50 is sort of the number that we want to be because that means that the student is making the average amount of growth compared to their peers nationwide, right? They're, they're, they're right in the middle. They're making just as much growth as 50% of the students there. So on average, both um, students receiving previous lunch and those not receiving previous lunch are making more growth than that. Um, so this is a, a pretty compelling story. I think it's important to kind of take these two pieces together because in order to change the proficiency, there's going to need to be a lot of growth, right? Our, some of our students who, who, who are struggling and, and, and are a little behind, they're going to need greater growth in order to reach those goals that we've set for them. Um, but this was a really exciting way to see that um, this is one area where we don't see those big differences like we did. And how many years have we been doing STAR test? We've been doing it for five years, maybe. Okay. Four years. Do we have any data on like getting kids over the bar? I, I, I believe Julie Brown um, does with like specific students. I think she's she's done some sort of even deeper dives down into individual students and sort of looking at 
well, what are the pieces that are keeping in place for the student to, to achieve that proficiency level? Um, and so she's been looking at it at a very individual level for students. And this is collapsed data. So, you know, we're doing the majority of the work, K3, we're changing our strategies and the upper grades, but this is grades three through 10. So really when you think of the N and all the different kids we're describing by this, really is like our first kind of inkling that we are moving in the right direction. We've just started this work at ours the last year with a new curriculum this year. So to begin to see growth levels, and I think for me, what's exciting too, I, I want those free news for lunches of students to grow at a 53. I also want students who are coming in reading to continue to grow. You know, we do have a lot of students who arrive in our door who have lots of good skills, but our job is to make sure they continue to develop their skills and that growth is happening. So there's a lot in that that makes me excited. And again, it's our first level canary in the cold line saying, okay, you're having, you know, it's the trends that we want to be having. Um, and then we could be really proud of it. And asking for any other questions. Um, some of the other equity data we look at, 30% uh, of our students have been identified as economically disadvantaged. That's up 18%. So we, we were worried in the last few years that we were really losing a sector of our, our student population. Um, we, we weren't having kids signing up for free, we were serving lunch to everybody, so we're finally, with a new way of collecting this information, having a more accurate representation of our free and reduced lunch, our economically disadvantaged students, and a 30% population, to me, is a much more healthy community, so I'm glad to see that, not that they're economically disadvantaged, but that we have more diversity economically in our communities. Um, we have half of those students are in leadership positions or economically disadvantaged. Half of those students are enrolled in AP classes. That's something we really want to continue to build, but it is up 11% from the previous year. 74% um, of those students are involved in our disciplinary action. Oh, 74% of our disciplinary action involve male students. That's down 7%. So the conversations that, that we began as a result of looking at that data last year have already been to have an impact. We asked this last year, are these frequent um, repeaters? Or are they? I'm going to ask uh, the experts and who are the ones having those conversations every day. Aaron and Brandon. I don't know the the district number, but again, um, as far as the different settings, um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that one, Elliot. Okay. Yes, it's not uncommon for the same student to right. That's yeah. I think so, yeah. so it doesn't it's not uncommon. Right. So the number doesn't exactly tell. Mm -hmm. Right, maybe it could be. But I think I still think it is the right. conversation we've been having is around how do we respond to behavior that may be different than what we would expect in a classroom, and so male versus female. But I think there's a behavioral presentation that we talk about, and how are we engaging with those students? And I know Cody's led a group with Graph and the middle school and high school having that. Aaron and I have been collecting data at the middle school, but really having conversations with our male students about what their experience is and what we can do to make sure they have voice and engagement and heard and movement. And that's that all came from reviewing this data, which was really helpful. Thank you, Rack, for bringing that. Um, and that 7% decrease, there's also a 7% decrease overall, right? It's not just that girls are getting worse and then so boys are looking better. <laughs> Which yeah, that's also okay. hard to tell because we okay. have you know, changed how we like, collected data. So we have far more incidents reported in our system that we're looking at. So that's another data point. It's hard to it's hard to know whether that's gone down. Yeah, and major versus minors. I mean, the majority of the in the middle school and high school is cell phone and skipping. You know, the minor the minority are those high level state reportable incidents, though they occur last yeah. week was an anomaly, but it was a hard week. So it's there's still high school students and they're still taking risky behaviors and we're still need to be there. Um, but I think that the kinds of behaviors we see are ones that are, um, and Cody, I'm speaking for you, that through our restorative practices and conversations and again, attending to it at the middle school, developing relationships then, giving students that ability to talk about and bring, rather than acting out, I know adults, I can have a conversation, they, they'll listen to me. All those pieces, starting as soon as they enter the middle school and high school is really critical, changes the culture. 
kinds of things we see. Going up one line, sure. What kinds of um, economic supports do we give students for taking AP tests? Like we're having, yeah. We also pay for the AP tests. Okay. Yep. Not so, for all of them. Not for all of them. Yeah. But there, there's what well, we think for one per each. Each should get one paid for, and then the college board significantly uh, cuts down the cost for people who have like. Um, in terms of our BIPOC students, 9% um, of our MVSU student, students identify as BIPOC. It's every year we've gone up one click. Um, our faculty and staff, only 3%. So that number has decreased. We continue to look for diverse faculty, different experiences. It's an incredibly challenging market for teachers. So that's something that we continue to work hard on. 4% um, of or 5% of our students in leadership positions uh, identify as BIPOC. Only 17% of the disciplinary incidents at the MVSU school enroll BIPOC students, and 9% of students enrolled in AP classes identify as BIPOC. Is that number up? The last one? The, the AP classes, I think that's been pretty consistent. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Um, in terms of actions taken, I just really want to highlight the, the work of the Late Start Wednesdays. I know this has been a challenge for some families, but that is when our teachers are really looking at implementation of our EIB policy. And that's when they're doing the individual work. They can either select um, a session that we train and we're offering professional guidance, or people can select and develop their own plans. And so this is just a real cross um, uh, list of some of the things the teachers worked on, restorative practices, literacy as social justice, culturally responsive music education, uh, book reading on poverty and health, impact of removing affirmative action to college admissions, aligning science lessons with EL curriculum, and teaching preschool with an equity lens. So those are some of the topics, and it's a long list. And teachers at the end really have to justify how this reinforces our current equity, inclusion, and diversity policy. Um, and the last part of the annual report is the superintendent's report. And this is the part that's required, again, by the board. Um, to look at um, our tuition, our, our tuition, our enrollment, our financial pieces, as well as our um, how our students are doing um, with their scores on the state testing, and then on terms of how they're compliant with the strategic plan. And so I use this slide all the time. So when we talk about what are we teaching and what's our teaching for next year and how full our schools are going to be, this is the data and enrollment, again, taken from the February board report. Um, when we talk about how many students will be entering Prosper Valley, you can see if you combine Reading with West, that's 52 students. That's a major change from the 34 that are currently in there. So, and it also really shows, if you look at the numbers down a column, I think Killington is a great example. Grade two, we have 15 and grade eight and grade three, we have eight. Having such a range of size of classes makes it really challenging. Our teachers have to be so nimble. Um, you never know how many students you're going to have year to year, what the student population is going to be like. It is a challenge annually for principals and, and teachers to think about what is next year going to look like, because it can be so different year to year. As well as in the high schools, you can see again, our seventh and eighth grade, 65, 64, that's smaller than it had been in the past. And then that bump up in grade nine as we begin to collect students from other districts, 86, 80. Grade 11 is 76, smaller. That's post COVID group that we talk about. And then our graduating class of 2024, uh, 83 students, senior, junior privileges. <laughs> Mr. Corsi, you and I have to talk. Albert Foster. <laughs> <laughs> You'll feel differently next year. Um, in terms of student-staff ratios, I think the board has been really helpful. You can see uh, second to the bottom column, our row really consistent in terms of how many teachers to students across, pretty um, more so than we have in previous years. Um, you can see the increase in administration, um, yeah, administration uh, at Woodstock Elementary, one to one twenty-seven, and we have a um, over two hundred students in that building. In terms of um, our cost per student, um, you can see some variability, West being the lowest, Reading with the most, but around the middle, the median there is pretty consistent around 20,000, uh, 
21,019, pretty consistent across Barnard, Killington, Prosper Valley, and the middle school and high school. Um, looking at our Vermont uh, VCAP score, or Cognia, last year was the first year we administered Cognia. We didn't have a lot of state support. It was rushed out pretty quickly. We do have some variability around scores um, and that we're looking at, and we will, um, some schools are already starting the Cognia, Cognia testing, um, if I'm right, and some will finish up after break. Again, then we'll have some better ability to compare our scores in EL and math and science. You can see Barnard was above the district average in both ELA, ELA math and science. So in terms of student outcomes, basically what I just said, that we've seen patterns of strengths and challenges were observed across with Barnard performing above district averages in both math and ELA, as well as science. I think it's really important for us to get a second year of data. Um, we don't have comparisons from across the state. Uh, we have, we heard some things that maybe we'll see something, but Agency of Education Vermont, it would be nice to be able to compare not only with our between our buildings, but across the state of Vermont on Cognia. Financial. So this is a complex algorithm that, of school board members who weren't here before, but basically we every year we look at our uh, average per pupil cost. We calculate what 120% of that annual per pupil cost is. Then for three years, we average what those 120% are, and then we see if any of our schools are above that. And for the second year, Reading Elementary was above that, uh, the number based on that as a rhythm. And that's how the policy has us talk about financial financials in the district. Enrollment, well, overall enrollment in the district has remained consistent. Data shows that growth is occurring in the elementary grades and at grade nine. There continues to be variability from year to year with the greatest growth in our pre-K programs and at ninth grade. And so this is the last paragraph that I always write. Um, I know, Allison, I'm sorry. That's what we So this policy requires the superintendent to make a recommendation regarding the sustainability of each of our campuses based on enrollment, student outcome, and cost as well as their alignment with the current strategic plan. All of our campuses are maintaining our enrollment. And based on one year of state data, there is some variability in student outcomes. Comparison to this spring's data will show allow for greater insights. While Reading is per student cost exceed the district average for a second year, I believe that Reading Elementary School allows all of our elementary classrooms to maintain a healthy class size that provides the greatest opportunities for positive student outcomes. I recommend no action be taken at this time by the board. Um, I think when we think about the students who are current in Rending Elementary, if for um, any reason we were looking at moving those students, there would be significant impact on class sizes across the district. And I am thinking of our teaching and learning policy. I think that would be a great challenge. So that's my personal opinion and recommendation at this time for your consideration. And so, again, we have great communication tools from our principals. Uh, this is the link to our principal newsletters um, so that you can really be in touch with the kinds of activities and the quality programs and the things that our students are doing. And I always want to, at the end of uh, the annual report, thank all the organizations that support, as you know, Jen said in her, all the work she's doing beyond the budget that is grant funded. Um, our taxpayers support us strongly past our budget. In addition, we have many other groups that support our work and, again, add to the capacity and the creativity of our program. And I think it's important to recognize them in our annual report. Questions? Thoughts? I'll go back in case there's any. Matt has a question. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, thanks, Sherry. Really appreciate it. What um, fantastic things we're doing as a district. Um, I I do have a few follow up items, maybe for an, a future meeting. Um, the on slide fourteen, when when we showed the decrease uh, from seventy one percent to fifty six percent in post secondary enrollment after their first year of graduation, mm -hmm. mentioned it was a smaller class, but I I don't think that would really explain it. Is it possible to dig in a little deeper and figure out 
maybe why the 2023 class had such a lower uh, postgraduate enrollment? Again, not for right now, but maybe a future meeting. Sure, Matt. And then the the, the BT cap cognitive results. Uh, I know we just have one year of data, but it would be great if we could uh, see those results once the 23, 24 uh, data come in. Do you have an expectation of when those results might come in? I, th I know some of the testing is still going on. When do we, we typically, when the state will release them? Yeah, there, there's um one of the real, yes. So one of the challenges with it is the state embargoes the data for a period of time. Um, and they do this because they've had to make changes that we don't see behind the scenes. They don't want us releasing scores that are, are inaccurate. Um, this embargo period sometimes has lasted months. Um, sometimes it's been embargoed until minutes. So um, I think the, the hope is that we would see the data over the summer, um, but we don't know. Okay, I would just ask once you have it, Raph, if you could share it with the board, that would be great. Yeah. Um, and then my my last thing is just the, I think just a couple slides ago, the quote was that enrollment is consistent. And I know we just did a bit of a deep dive in the last board meeting a month ago, and it looked pretty clear that enrollment was declining, um, especially when you back out the pre-K and compare it to, to previous years. So I, I would just note that, you know, anything we can do proactively that like we've talked about with um, with the new build to bring kids into our district, uh, maybe meeting with some of the sending towns, I would I would highly encourage that. And that's that's all my comments. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. Anybody else? Yes, Josh. So just a quick question, because I wasn't part of the board when Plymouth and um, Bridgewater were shut down as schools, but just because I don't know the numbers, where were they for cost per pupil in comparison to where Reading stands right now? We didn't do an analysis back then. Okay. So we weren't collecting, we were individual districts, mm -hmm. both Bridgewater and so Plymouth was not part of this SU when Plymouth closed. Yep. They joined post that. And then when Bridgewater, um, and again, that was a decision based on their grid comfort and Bridgewater made the decision to combine but, because of some of the facility needs and Bridgewater. And I was just yeah. curious. How we, yeah, we weren't collecting the data okay. that got formed. Good question, Josh. Thank you. Uh, I, I recall that Plymouth was in going down almost into the teens yeah. in the number of students they had yeah. for their elementary school. Yeah, no, I just wasn't sure what the per pupil cost was. I just wanted to have that knowledge compared to what Brent is at, 26,000. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Well, thank you, Sherry. That was quite comprehensive and it's all linked in our agendas. So if you want to go back and look again, have other questions you should feel free to direct them to sherry and she'll send them along to others if need be thank you all right um now we have the cip team and jen settle to approve oh do we need oh, to do yeah. we, um we don't need to approve your review right yeah now. uh so um every year um when we put in for our federal money through title we also have to complete a form called a CIP, Continuous Improvement Plan. Um, for us, it's very easy because we're always looking at our data and we're always setting goals. And so I pretty much just pluck those goals that we already have and put them on the form and submit them. Um, so I linked it here and uh, the feds are now requiring boards to approve our CIPs before we submit them. So can you, Sherry, can you put that up on the screen uh, on the agenda? Uh, in a minute, so I don't have the agenda. Do you want to put that up? Um, I think people might want to, if they haven't had a chance to see okay, it. Yeah, I, I looked at it, but I don't know if there's any things you want to highlight, Jen, in that. Um, well, we're really familiar with our math and ELA proficiency goals. So there are two categories of goals we have to provide. One's an academic success, and we have our math and literacy ones. Um, and then the other category is in um, safe and healthy schools. And um, so we... 
I have it up. Do you want me to share my screen? I've got it. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. yeah, like a ninja. Um, and so what we have to do is just provide um, a goal. Um, and we tend to keep these goals very broad so that as throughout the course of the year, as we have um, funding needs arise, um, we can fit them within our goals. And um, so we have goals, some ideas for how to um, enact upon those goals, some data we would collect and how we might support that goal within our district. So the first one is in safe and healthy schools. And then the next one is in academic achievement of student success. Um, it's a it's a hoop, but it's a helpful hoop because we want to make sure that we're spending our money in appropriate ways that match what our data tells us we need. So um, that's what this document is. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any further questions before we vote? I think we're okay to then would somebody make a motion to approve the okay. continuous improvement plan on the for the CIP for current by 25 to current. Is there a second? I'll second. John Williams, thank you. All in favor of accepting the uh continuous improvement uh plan grant, please say aye. Uh -huh. aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank it you is approved. Great. Thank you. All right. At this time now, the board um, is going to take a, uh, some minutes to discuss the uh, MBSD survey result. Uh, ben has prepared some information for us to consider um, to see what things there came up um, in that uh, 1,400 persons answered the survey out of the 3,500 voters that voted. So we have, we feel we have a, a reasonably complete list of concerns and or um, positive comments that were made. Thank you, Perry. And I've got a presentation. I just realized that I had not joined the Zoom meeting, so I'm joining now. And Sherry, if you could make me a presenter. Hey, oh, Raina. Oh, Raina, okay. Oh, she's there. Right. When I join, I got you. Is she making? I'm connecting. Okay. 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 So let me see. Okay. She took you more than I. into in the beginning of the presentation. Okay, this is a this is the night where the board looks at very dense slides, um, apparently. <laughs> but I have cute kids. Yeah, I don't have any pictures in mind, but um, hopefully this will be an insightful uh, walk through the survey uh, that uh, was put out after the, the bond vote. Um, just as a kind of an overview here of what we're gonna go through tonight, just looking at the, the format and the questions and some of the rationale behind you know, why we asked the questions that we did. Then we're going to look at some of the demographics, the overall numbers. I won't bury the lead. We got over 1,400 responses to the survey. And you think that we had about 3,550 vote, 3,550. 3, that's an immense number of responses. So by any measure, that's a very successful number in terms of participation. Then we're going to look at the three kind of categories of voters. We had people identify how they voted in order to kind of ask the question why you, people voted the way that they did. And uh, so yes, no, and undecided, we'll take a look at some of the rationale behind um, why people were saying they voted the way that they did, and then look at some sample comments uh, that kind of represent some of those rationales. And then um, I think maybe the, hopefully the this process, what we're really looking for, at least my uh, opinion is that it's ideas and suggestions that people who you know want to be involved in the process and have some ways that we can kind of move the ball um, then that's we're you know we're absolutely all ears and we've got a, a slide there kind of um, you know collecting those uh, what we've got today and then looking at the next steps. So um, the format and questions. This is very dense, uh, but this is essentially 
the, the format itself was uh, we used SurveyMonkey. Uh, you, one of our community volunteers, kind of uh, you know, facile with that approach, helped us put out the uh, the survey itself. We distribute it on social media, school newsletters, community forums, listservs in all of our communities. Um, Sam helped us uh, on, from the communications committee, so thank you, Sam. Um, next are the questions of the survey, and they're probably like eight or ten as you step through, but they essentially boil down to three things. First, just an easy question, what town are you located in? Some responses, I think people were a little bit tense uh, about that. At least some perspectives that we got, and we certainly weren't thinking of this as you know, was the board trying to like unveil, you know, who was voting uh, in, in what ways, you know, in, in certain towns when like the statute for school unified school districts doesn't really provide for that. That certainly wasn't our intent. We were really just trying to ease people into the survey to say, okay, where are you from? Um, the next question was, you know, how did you vote? And then assurances there of um, of anonymity. And that was absolutely adhered to. We did receive a ton of data and a good bit of personal data. So we had to be very careful in terms of you know, how we shared that data. It was Carrie, myself, uh, the community volunteers who helped us actually administer the survey, uh, and some members of the administration, uh, Bryce Samuel as well, was part of the process. But this question is essentially the same for each category. It's, you know, what was it that ultimately led you to vote the way you did? And then if you were on the fence or torn, tell us why. And the thinking there was to really prompt an open-ended response to get people just kind of speaking about you know, their, their experience with the voter. And having that open-ended response enabled us to kind of hopefully get some insights that we wouldn't have otherwise had if we were kind of saying, you know, pick this box. And then uh, the third question there is, are, do you want to be part of the process? As we work to, in the coming weeks to bring the next uh, vote proposal to the community, do you want to be involved? Uh, and then if people said yes, we said, well, it's your, it's your contact info. Um, so um, just an overview of the responses. Um, I'm going to click over to uh, this screen so you can see, um, you know, in terms of what, you know, towns people were located in. And here again, we, we had 1,404 responses to the survey. And as you can see, this is pretty representative um, of, you know, just population in general. I thought it was interesting that we had a number of responses from individuals outside of the district, so people who wouldn't have been voting because you know, they live outside. Uh, but anyway, uh, by far and away, the most responses came from Woodstock, uh, and then Pomfret, Barnard, and then the other towns had less uh, participation. Um, then in terms of um, uh, how did you vote, almost a, 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 you know, a real 50 50 here right you had 583 people who responded said that they voted yes 580 said no and then a pretty healthy collection of undecided or people who said they didn't vote because they weren't eligible to vote uh, and that was a category that we thought we might get maybe some students responding right not old enough um, but there were you know various reasons for why you know people identified as not being eligible not registered you know uh, not living in the district and then um, in terms of um, you know, how for the people who weren't eligible, uh, not, not a ton of responses here. Um, you know, how would you have voted if you could have voted? You know, 42 saying they would have voted yes, 55 said they would have voted no. And then um, we'll get into these narrative responses for, you know, why did you vote the way that you did? And then uh, let's see, and then people wanting to be a part of the process. Uh, I thought this was really interesting. Uh, and this kind of happened in a couple of, of, of places, right, where people said, yeah, I voted yes, what would you want to be part of the process? Um, you know, people were identifying there as they went through, but we wound up getting, I believe, uh, you know, 200, see, uh, 193 plus, what's that, 149, so yeah, well over 300 people saying, yeah, I'd like to be part of the process. Not everybody gave their email once they were prompted for it, but we have a, a literal legion of people who are <laughs> Who are uh, wanting to be part of this going forward, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, so getting back to the uh, kind of unpacking some of the results, uh, we see. Yeah, do you, do you think that the people who are ineligible are non-homesteaders? Um, yeah, there's a good a good number there, and I'll show you. There's some a sample comment from somebody who said, "Yeah, I'm fine. We've been second homeowners for a long time. And certainly, we're represented." Intuition families. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. That's yeah. Okay, so let's um, unpack the yes voters. So I have a couple slides here for each of these categories of just kind of the reasons, and these are roughly rank ordered. We we didn't so 
uh, Karen and I have spent a, a lot of time with this data, right? And you know, reading every response and getting a sense of kind of people's reasons. And these certainly aren't the only reasons, they're the most common. Uh, but you know, the number one reason I would say, and um, Carrie, you can keep me honest from your own review of the data or Sherry for that matter, uh, was really people just saying you know, the age and the condition of the current facility and the need for a new school building. That was the most often cited. From there, I think the most common was just people saying, I have kids who will go to the school. Right. Um, then it was um, there was a, a strong sentiment that the project would only get more expensive over time. Like you know, we can't afford to wait. It was something that we saw a, a lot. So a financial concern, by some urgency around it. Safety and health concerns. Uh, obviously, you know, the school layout or um, you know, toxic uh, sort of substances. You know, so it showed up a lot as motivating people to vote yes. School tours were cited as something as being very helpful. Um, the importance of having a middle school or high school in the community and not letting the building fail. Um, that also showed up uh, very prevalently. And then uh, the next few are just kind of kind of philosophical support of, of public education, civic responsibility to provide public education, education being a good investment. Um, the, uh, this, I, I, this was uh, affirming for me, the tax calculator, helping people to decide, people running their numbers and saying that they got comfortable with it. Um, then the notion that, you know, strong schools attract young families, uh, also around keeping property values up, kind of demand for the housing, um, some shout outs for the school board, trust and appreciation for the process and how thorough things uh, were in the presentations we provided. And then I'd say the last one that was, you know, pretty common was that, you know, this building is, is gone for, you know, a long time. It's, Often people citing this, the fact that we're you know, the second worst in the state in terms of uh, school uh, facilities. Um, now, here's where we get into some interesting things. So this is for the yes voters, and this is what I categorized as concern. So like people who voted yes, but then we asked, well, were you torn and what kind of put you on the fence? And we had much more content here coming from yes voters than we did from no voters. And this gives you kind of a sense of like people saying, I voted yes, but you know, it'd be great if so the, the, I'd say the top one there was just kind of state of um, education funding, right? The school construction aid program, people really wanting that component to be locked down. Um, then the next two, it's a little, I was being a little cute here with these two, is you got a lot of conflicting sort of concerns around the size of the building. You know, is it too big? Is it too small? People kind of coming out on both sides of that, uh, depending on where they see the district going. Um, people just really wanting more mitigation of the cost, saying, I kind of held my nose and voted yes, but it would be great if this thing could just be a, a lot less expensive. And then uh, people talking about um, the, the river corridor, the floodplain that the building is to be, the river corridor, yes, uh, not in the floodplain, but I don't know that the message really got out about, um, about that, or maybe, maybe it could have been some um, information going around about it. Um, there's a, a big concern about the availability of affordable housing in the district. Um, the turf field was a little bit of a, I'll call it a, a football. Um, so this is something that we wound up cutting, but a lot of yes voters and no voters were saying, you really should have kept that in. And one of the reasons you see a lot of support for the athletic programs in the school and the turf field kind of um, people citing as needing that to kind of take our athletic programs to the next level, host championship games, that sort of thing. Um, also, people were concerned about like not having uh, as many options as they as you know they may have liked, or you know transparency of the process, and then really around um, okay, this this new building is great, but this is really all about education, and the and the emphasis really should be more on you know what goes on inside the building versus the building itself. So that was interesting. Um, and here's some. Uh, some comments, some representative wants to let you guys read those. I don't need to read them for you. <laughs> Question. Kind of page here of some of the yes comments. I just have you know two two slides for each. So Ben, yeah, can you read those? I can't see it from back here, please. Um, I'd really rather not. Mark, did you? Okay. Come? 
I'm looking at it at home. Don't worry about it. Do you want to come up? You can get no. on my computer. Do I? Not even from there. So I can Don't worry. Okay. Here we go. You see here some of the torn aspect of, you know, we've got people kind of on the fence. Ben, can I ask, um, I didn't see these slides in the slide deck in our board book. Is that going to be available to the public so they can access it when they get home? Yeah, I'll put it in the minutes. I apologize. I was working on them up to the meeting. Our plan is to release them out to the communities as well through the same systems of communication, but we thought the board should have a chance to look okay. at it first. Received. Yeah, I just want to make sure that the public has access to this. Certainly. Thank you. Everybody good with me? Moving on. Okay. Um, so now let's look at the, some of the no voter rationale and concerns. Um, so a lot more kind of rationale given here, I would say. Um, but far and away, and this was interesting to me that the and I make a distinction here between one and two was the the project amount, the 99 million was far and away the thing that was cited as being like the biggest reason for people to vote no. That's too expensive. And it took different um, kind of versions. The sticker price itself, we're just saying it's too extravagant, too big, too many extras are in the building. Uh, different aspects were cited by different respondents, the, the theater, the double gym, some things that weren't even in the scope were cited as a reason for why they voted no, like the dome on the, on the building. I think that was a rumor that went around communities. Uh, the turf field, I think some respondents thought that we did have a turf field and that was the reason that they were citing for voting no. So again, that's why I was kind of saying that was a football. Um, so, and then the next thing, it, here's the distinction is that people spoke differently about the project making property taxes unaffordable, right? Some people just said it's too much, it's, it's, it's too glitzy, it's too extravagant. Others said taxes are out of control, right? And, and differently. One thing that's interesting to note was that you saw people kind of using the calculator on the yes side. You didn't see very many people on the no side saying, I ran my numbers and what came out, I couldn't afford. Right. I don't think there were any comments. Yeah, I don't I don't believe so. So that just kind of an insight around affordability. Um, then the belief that the current school could be renovated for less. This has always been um, you know, something that we've heard. We start our FAQs on the website with, you know, why can't the building be renovated? A lot of the guidance that we've gotten from the architectural team around that, but that still is one of the most prevalent reasons people saying, surely we could do it cheaper, we could renovate the building. Um, the st state of uh, state education funding was uh, you know, obviously a big one. Um, contribute states, uh, the construction aid program going offline. Um, second homeowners, kind of a related issue, was one that people uh, talk a lot about, saying it's not fair that their taxes don't change as a result of um, the school bond passing. Um, Woodstock voters, people who kind of identify, I, mean, I think this is uh, was a, a major theme for them, not the only community, but just too many other big tax hits at the same time. You know, this big increase in um, ed taxes, and then for Woodstock and the aqueduct, the, the, the sewer facility, or kind of the unknowns around that, people not being able to get their heads around what the overall tax impact were going to be. Uh, on the two big side, there were a lot of people who talked about in the side the building being right size for our, our enrollment, 450 currently. How are you going to get to 600? Don't believe, you know, not believing the enrollment projections um, or that you can drive that. Um, and then, um, excuse me, uh, okay, yeah, uh, number nine, um, transparency, just kind of not trusting the process, um, not no, no detailed costs being provided, and no options was a, a really significant one that we saw throughout the responses. People saying, hey, just kind of foisted this thing on us at the, you know, 11th hour, and we didn't get to you know, see any of the alternatives that were considered or participate in them. Um, there was a very prevalent sentiment among no voters that the current school was not properly maintained, that uh, you know, more could have been done to you know, kind of preserve its condition. Uh, the net zero geothermal stuff, um, a lot of voters, these are a couple of political ones in 11 and 12, people saying, yeah, that green stuff, you know, that's all political. You're pushing this agenda on us, get that out of there. Uh, similarly, uh, people 
believing that you know, um, you know, I'm not convinced that education would be improved by the new school. And then a lot of dissatisfaction, I would say, was expressed among the no voters with kind of the teaching experience in the, you know, in the, in the district. Um, and then, you know, a lot of sentiment around political agenda, things, some diversity initiatives, trans, BLM, uh, that, those sort of, um, sort of themes. Um, there was a, a pretty significant us versus them sort of uh, sentiment among many no voters, like, and this is being foisted on people who've lived here for a long time by wealthy newcomers, and it's going to push out people who've lived here for generations. Um, and so that was you know, definitely a theme. And then a lot of people were just put off by the promotions, right? The, the mailers, the yard signs, um, the uh, kind of overzealousness, well, perceived overzealousness of, of people who were kind of voting yes and, and um, you know, pushing on people. Um, not a ton of kind of concerns expressed by no voters. They tended to kind of really center around the financial aspects, but some of the things where people were saying that they were on the fence was um, you didn't see uh, a ton of people you know, challenging the need to do something, right? Which is interesting. For a long time, we've been doing this project and the need is, um, is needed to be established, right? But it seems to have been kind of across both sides. Everybody kind of recognizes that we need to do something. And then concerns about like, yeah, recognizing that um, it is you know, kind of a waste of uh, you know, uh, patching up the current school, certainly not, not all no voters, but that was a thread. And then people really um, talking about the importance of the school to the community, right? Saying like, we can't let it you know, languish. Um, here's some, again, a couple slides here on some you know, samples from no voters uh, comments. Let everybody read these. Here you see some of that, like you know, um, acknowledging the need, but um, not not at this time or not this project. And then another uh, page with three more comments from no voters. So you see a lot of those themes kind of coming through in the, in the narrative there. Okay, and for the undecided voters, um, not quite as much rationale here. I was really surprised by the, the number of people who said, you know, they had planned to vote, but, you know, forgot or just had a conflict or couldn't get to the polls. It makes sense, right? I mean, we have a lot of people who live in pretty far flown places and on March 5th, it's pretty rainy and slushy. Um, some people said it was too dangerous to, to go that day. Anyway, some of the same themes that you see from the, the no voters, some of the concerns. And here's some, uh, here's some of the narratives around undecideds. And that first one, Elliot gets to your question. Yeah, I think timing taxes, you know, obviously, um, we knew this was significant headwinds, so it's uh, certainly coming through. Okay, so on the ideas and suggestions, um, I thought this was uh, 
pretty good list. This is certainly isn't exhaustive of everything we saw in the 1400 responses, but I think these are some of the, the best ones. And this is something that this first one is, we kind of rolled around in this, uh, Carrie and I and a couple of the other people looking at the surveys. Um, this idea, you know, can we build something smaller or scale it back? And then, you know, if, if the enrollment projections, uh, you know, come to bear, then add more at a later time, a phased or modular approach was something that um, you can, you know, think about other schools that have seen growth and had the luxury of being able to do that. Um, you know, that's certainly would be um, less risk involved in, you know, taking out like a $99 million bond up front. Um, this is an idea um, getting ski areas to charge a small fee going directly to schools. That takes some coordination. I thought that was a good idea. These next two are not very, uh, I don't think this group would appreciate them, but you saw it a lot in surveys, people talking about you know, closing the school and sending students to other schools, consolidating our elementary schools to save costs. Um, one idea was to do a virtual tour online uh, from those who felt that the, the school tour was insightful. And then um, this theme around, you know, that the wealthy versus the blue collar um, elements of our communities, you know, a call for more dialogue, uh, more connection between okay. um, geothermal heat, solar. Some people said get rid of it. Others said it just seems to be better explained um, from a financial aspect to understand, you know, if it's better financially and then explain why it's better. Um, and then, um, this is one that came up a few times, um, stripping out the project kind of recognized that the town of stock has got the, the town hall project. I mean, separate kind of government entities, but a lot of people probably Woodstock residents had that idea. And then, um, some people saying like, Hey, this is amazing that you've done this capital campaign and you've raised as much money as you have. This seems like the, the way to go. If you can invest more in that and raise more money, then you'd probably be able to get this thing through. So here's some of the, the comments from the uh, people who had great ideas. financial donations and yeah okay great so that's as much reading as i'll have uh, make everybody do tonight uh, from the uh, survey responses but uh, just talking about next steps uh, from here uh, was, as we talked about at the last uh, board meeting we'll be looking for board members to be scheduling listening sessions in each member town to kind of keep these dialogues going and keep the uh, generation of ideas um, those uh, and then also we'll be providing the board members from each town with the names of people who said, yeah, I want to be part of that process. So you can reach out to them as you're setting up those listening sessions and um, you know, get them to the, to the sessions and get engaged. Um, from there, we'll also be looking at uh, being responsive to some of the calls for information, really developing uh, materials about the, you know, the process, the stakeholders who've been involved, what options have been evaluated to kind of be responsive to concerns we've done all that stuff you know um, people should should know about it who want to know about it and then um moving forward uh working with the architect the construction company owners reps to gather more information and what our options would be and, uh, you heard jim talk about the walkthrough at the building tomorrow to look at you know pricing for renovations being more um, current and transparent about uh, those efforts all right that was uh dense Appreciate everybody uh, <laughs> going along. Any uh, any discussion of the uh, of the survey? I guess my question: Oh, are you going to provide? I guess you in an email you said you're going to provide some sort of a template or questions that we should for the listening sessions. Yeah. Yes, we we um, we will provide some structure for those people okay. that want that kind of thing. Yeah. And then, so the next part is after we give that back to you guys, are you going to consolidate that into another presentation or into something else? Well, at least see what the common themes are. 
and see if they line up. Um, I mean, there were, I don't know, 1,100 comments, I think, that we read. I read them through twice. Um, and, you know, just reading through, I think we had a pretty diverse amount of information here. And I don't think that the major themes will change a whole lot, but if there's some novel things that come out of your towns. I mean, there'll be way that we'll be reporting back to you. I yes, yes. So, is it is the primary or is it or the an sort of explosive yes. goal or uh, point of the listening sessions to do the kind of information and idea gathering and feedback that we kind of did via the survey, or I mean, I'm I'm wondering, you know, it's it takes a lot to get sometimes to get folks to come when you get a lot of people coming to a, a meeting in town it's nice to be able to kind of utilize it yeah. as much as you can and i'm just wondering to what extent like you know we can we can have i mean when things are brought up that are you know the say it's a piece of incorrect information you mm -hmm. know like to what extent Ought we to, and will we sort of have the ability to in those in that that kind of listening section, um, you know, give information that we have, and we, and we talk about sort of developing. I, mean, I know there's already some there's materials and stuff online, but um, I guess it's just kind of an open question, like how appropriate will it do? Do people see that being? In these listening sessions, because I don't want you know you don't want it to turn it into like a uh, you know to be about details of something which you know individual board members may not be as well versed in sort of yeah. all this stuff. Yes, I, I'd say that's not the goal to kind of like set the record straight. Yeah. It's really to get engagement and get yeah. people talking with each other in right. at the community level in terms of like getting uh, attendance. I mean, a Zoom option, like all things that we do, I mm -hmm. think is uh, essential, right? To be able to kind of maximize the participation. Mm -hmm. um, that way, you don't have to have people, you know, traveling to, you know, make these things. Right. So it's likely that there were people who never even knew about a survey that was online. It's possible there are people yeah. who are. So those folks who don't answer surveys or didn't feel comfortable saying it in writing they have a chance at a meeting to say mm -hmm. what's on their mind and, and to take some good notes mm -hmm. and then you know we know there are some inaccuracies in the assumptions but we're not going to sit down and make a list and counter yeah. all the things that like the, the turf field is easy we had already taken that out but some people didn't know that mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. things like that certainly want to make very very clear whenever we put forward a new bond vote or, or whatever it's going to support. So one thing I just wanted to bring up is whether it's a bond or, or just the budget, I think people, everybody's got to be very facile and under, be able to convey the way that we pay for education. And it's still not sure. understood by a lot of people. And it's very hard to sort of wrap your head around it. I think there was an article in Vermont Standard about Heartland, and they were talking about that had the school not even changed their budget at all, or actually closed the school, their budget would still go up by 20% because of the CLA. And I think people don't get it. And I mean, I think this, the way that's calculated is a really important problem. And people don't even think about it. I mean, they, they, they may think about it, but come August when we all get our bills and they're up by 20, 30%, and it's a lot of CLA stuff. And I think it's a real important, I mean, and you you do spend when you did your you spend a lot of money. We, that's really important. You just can't talk about the budget going up or this and that. It's the CLA on sort of multiplying that mm -hmm. or di dividing it. But <laughs> <laughs> yep, I think Bob, you're next, and then uh, Josh, and then Matt. Yeah, uh, what is the current status of our fundraising? Um, I'd love an update on that report. And what, if any, changes are we going to make to our strategy there? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Though I haven't gotten an update from Marlena recently. The last one was just before the bond vote. I think we had another fifty thousand uh, dollar commitment come in. Um, I haven't heard of anything coming in post bond vote, but I don't know if that's you know 
because it hadn't happened or just because I haven't heard, but we could certainly report out on that. Um, and then in terms of the strategy, I think it's worth thinking about. That was one of the ideas that came up, right? Like invest more in, in fundraising and see if there isn't more, well, more to be had. Um, Josh? So, I mean, we're just looking at that and all, all the discussions, it's all tax impact related, which comes back to more than just this bond. It came back to the CLA, mm -hmm. which is why we're being held hostage by the state. And that's why people, I think, are saying the state needs to pay their, their way. They're over here saying, well, we're going to pay for this district from that district. And we're going to call this one a gold town. We're going to call that one not a gold town. And I understand there's nothing we can do about it. But that's kind of the push that we need to make, as a, I think, as a board. We want to get this passed to our legislatures and to people that represent us in Montpelier that we're not going to stand for that. Like, this needs to change. I think that's kind of where we need to be as a board. And I think and that, Josh, you're bringing up the point that is really one of the most frustrating things for our communities. And um, what, we, what we've what we been talking about and with some other folks is activating some of our working groups with one of them being a legislative strand who would just be getting people to write letters to our legislators saying, you need to put that funding back in. You need to deal with some of these things that are breaking the backs of every Vermonter. So I think, you know, that's definitely one of the strategies that we will like to employ. I mean, it's kind of a step-to-step -step thing, but- It is, but I think uh, that's the, yeah. hopefully the, um, the the uh, learning uh, listening session will be covered by the media and it'll get the word out. And right. I, I mean, I, I, I agree. I just think, like I said, I just think it's one of those yeah. points that, you know, definitely I not that anything we did wrong with this building. I think it's the culmination of sure. 99 million on top of 33% in some towns. And yeah. right. I agree. It, it's just like, where does it come from? I, I mean, our, our incomes are going up right by those, by those percentages. Yep. How can our bills go up by those percentages? Right. I mean, and... <laughs> all all of us in this room can be writing to our legislators at any time. I just wrote to my legislators about the AOE secretary, <laughs> and I got a response. And hmm. who said one of them concurred with my concerns, and I will continue to do that. I have grave concerns about that. That's another topic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, I think this survey has given us really good results, um, and I and I think continuing with the listening tours is a is a great idea, especially just conveying the message that we're open to to changing our strategy to doing something different to uh, incorporating folks' feedback, um, and then I I do think at some point we would pivot to. Um, some some I think some focused sessions like on the themes that have been identified um it, it is so complex and there are so many issues that it seems as if you try to handle them all in one meeting um it, it just may not be productive but it seems like the themes around um could we renovate or has the building not been maintained you know that that could be like one session right just to talk about that um the issue of is it the right size versus our enrollment? It seems like that could be a session. Um, and then separately, just, you know, the financing of it. Should the state give more? Should non-homestead give more? How does our property tax system work? Um, and then I think something more specific for our user groups. Um, you know, it sounds like maybe the athletic community in the, you know, as part of our alumni, maybe could have been brought in um, in, a, in a stronger way. Those who are interested in the trades and vocational programs, um, those who are interested in maybe the arts and sciences and just sort of the educational value of the building, maybe that could be its own session. Um, and then lastly, like the environmental benefits that it clearly some folks didn't really understand the, the payoff of the geothermal and the solar. So anyway, I, I think it's great feedback. Still have a lot of work to do, but um, I, I feel good about, you know, the possibility that we pass this thing down the road. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else?
Uh, yes, Lara. Yeah, logistically. So you mentioned um, also presenting this on Zoom, mm -hmm. which is a great idea, but I'm going to need some tech support. <laughs> Because when we had the previous road show, I didn't have to worry about it. So um, if if Ryan and I, unless Ryan's willing to do the tech, um, we're going to need to figure them out. Lots of coaching for the sessions okay. and uh, yeah. attendance and personal you know support is not uh, out of the question. But uh, what we, I think we've talked about tech support right there. Who's yeah. one of our student reps that Aiden could jump right in? He's a Zoom master. But I think what we've recognized is this: you know, we've we've kind of been going forward with you know the new build committee, the architects, the engineers, people, uh, even community members who've been part of that thing for years. Right? There's for some reason this a little bit of a distinction between that group and the board, right? And people who are um, the interests of, of taxpayers in your own communities, and we need people to really engage more broadly. So that's the idea. And and the the thought I have on the listening um, tours of your communities in your communities is that it should really happen pretty soon before school gets out and momentum is lost, um, and we all go into summer mode. So um, I'd be happy, Ben and I would be happy to talk with any of the board members about wondering about the logistics of that. Um, we have another person who is interested in helping us with the structure of what those meetings could look like. You certainly, if you've got a big group of people in your town, you would need to have a timing mechanism. For example, um, you would probably wanna say, if this topic's already been raised, could you wait? Or can you only speak one time until everyone's had a chance? Some of those simple things to structure a big conversation. Some of the towns are much smaller and less formal, and you probably don't need to have to worry about that too much. I mean, nobody likes to be the hammer, so you have to decide which one to use the hammer <laughs> in your in your in your meetings uh, to to use the timer as needed, so that everyone has a chance. It you know, and you're probably going to hear the same things that. You know, we just presented, but that's okay um, for people to continue making their points if they feel they need to make that point. And they, there might be other suggestions that are helpful. Um, you know, what is it that they're looking for? That type of thing. So we'll try to get that together very soon. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow, so maybe we can talk about that then. But um, certainly, the best thing would be now to be identifying a good date and a place where you can have that meeting. We don't recommend combining it with another town meeting. We think it should be a standalone. Uh, Corinne? Uh, I think it would be helpful to um, sort of before we have those meetings to have a sense for the board, to have a sense of, of the timeline, sort of the steps in the timeline following that. Obviously we can't you know, have detailed steps because it's, it's all sort of open at this point, but if people have, questions about like one person wants to be involved in like you know they want to be involved in the design of the the new design right you know what what are the sort of kind of like what Matt was talking about what are the pieces that are going to then following this information gathering be you know followed what are the threads that are going to be followed and sort of what um, you know, does the board generally have a sense of like what timeline are we looking for? Um, are we looking at to, you know, bringing something back? Yeah, we've talked about that quite a bit. And realistically, we think the earliest probably would be in September with, you know, more information mm -hmm. that's more detailed and offers, you know, perhaps some options including the renovation, depending on what comes back from that. And just the understanding that a renovation is probably a 20 year building and not a 60 year building. And that if you're looking at dollars to dollars, you're not looking at the same picture. Mm -hmm. um, and some things like that, that make it clear that, that if you choose this choice, this is what you get. If you choose this choice, this is what you get. So that it's not, it's totally transparent. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'd say at this point, there's a lot of things that can be under discussion uh, where we will see the folks tomorrow and certainly let them know where we're at if they're not completely sure. And 
you know, I don't know that we can say formally that this is what the, the vote's going to be on September 15th. Right. We're not ready to say that yet. So it, again, we appreciate your insights. So if you have thoughts about that, feel free to email or make a call to us. The, the high school, middle school um, group will, will likely be meeting and starting up this, you know, taking on some of this too. Mm -hmm. Well, and on that, sorry, just to follow up, um, one of the pieces uh, that I feel like we've talked about before getting kind of some more data on, and I don't know if it's in the works, is around um, sort of surrounding towns, um, folks who are already sending kids to the schools, but not only sort of promoting, right, coming here, but I, I'm curious about like, what are, what the, you know, if we're looking at trying to increase our enrollment in, in surrounding towns, what's the competition look like? Like, what do those high schools look like that are the, the options for towns like Heartland and whatever? And, and so then how, when we're looking at, you know, the design or the curriculum or the, you know, what we're, the programs that we have in our new building, you know, how is that comparing to those surrounding, mm -hmm. you know, high schools? And so how might we sort of see ourselves positioning well within that framework? So yeah. I don't know, like, you know, I know folks are thinking about that, but I'm not sure, you know, how we can take steps to sort of like getting information and data around. Right. That. And that's, that's again, along the lines of re reviving some of those uh, working groups, right. like configuration and enrollment might be able to take some of that investigation on it. It can't be just on yeah. two people. <laughs> right. Right. For sure. Elliot and then Anna. Yeah. I I think one of the things that we should try to um, bring out when we have these uh, sessions is the discrepancy that Mark brought up about why the budget passed by such a large number, but this did not. And whereas in the state, about 29% of the budget didn't pass, and right. it did pass. Right. So I don't know if that's something we can sort of draw out a little bit. Yeah. Because it's not a general sentiment about what's going on here. It's just... Yeah, I, I mean, I some people have said, well, you know, is your, is, are these towns anti-education? I said, I don't think so at all. Absolutely not by that this budget vote. And that's not what we heard at all. Right. We heard many different things, but everyone recognizes the need for good education. Anyway. Anna? Thanks. Um, I wanted to say how impressed I am, yeah. first of all, that uh, y'all read that many comments um, based on what I read that uh, takes a lot of uh, patience and uh, I really commend you for that. I want to um, strongly support Matt's approach, his suggestion of having categorical sessions as opposed to listening sessions. Um, you know, the folks uh, here in Reading that, uh, you know, took the survey, I don't expect that they're going to show up. And as has been mentioned, we expect a lot of the listening sessions to bring up similar sentiments that we got in the survey. Um, and so I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, moving forward in, a more, forward in a more categorical, you know, reasons uh, why folks are either undecided or um, voted no might be a better approach in use of our time than going out and, you know, duplicating this effort of collecting information. Um, so I've, uh, here, for me, at least, it feels much more productive and effective to go out and you know, talk about a certain category of, you know, this is, and especially with the new renovation numbers that I don't expect are going to be any smaller than previous renovation numbers, um, you know, having a, a, a more structured approach to a more of like an informational session with a listening part to it. I just feel like we've already done the listening part and setting up a, a whole new meeting outside of town meetings and trying to reach folks that didn't already hear about the survey through the same portals doesn't seem like it's going to bring many new voices or new ideas. I'm not against the listening. I'm all for it. I think it's really important. And I think that maybe um, going forward in a, in a different mm, approach would be uh, a better use of our time. And cheers to Matt for coming up with that idea because I think it's brilliant. Yeah, you could kill two birds with one stone if you did those sessions in each of our communities. Yeah. That's a good thought. Uh, I, I'm going to give you a call one day this week and chat further. I look forward to it. I heard there's a, some storm coming in, so good luck reaching me with all of my family at home with me. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. I've already declared that. No more. <laughs> oh, no more no snow days. Can I close the board chair on this? Please. <laughs>
I, I think it would have been nice to to have that idea. I think it's a great idea. I think it would have been nice to have it before we announced the listening tours, but I kind of feel like we need to follow through with that because we don't want people to accuse us of bait and switch or something like that. And what if there's a person in my town who would like to talk about a couple of the different ones and they don't want to have to go to five different meetings now to get all of their expressions right. put out there. So I don't know if maybe maybe the um, topical discussions could be somehow part of uh, these meetings mm -hmm. where we say, okay, in the May meeting, um, we especially invite public comment on this. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Right? Yeah, I, I agree. People aren't going to go to meeting after meeting. Just we could have from somebody who's on Zoom. Can we not keep sharing the screen so I can see who's speaking better? Oh, sure. Thank you. Sorry. You don't need to tell you that we're having a discussion. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> All right, Bob. Yeah, my thought is I like Matt's idea. And I agree that having a, a town, many town meetings on each one of these areas of discussion is probably out of the question. How about if we develop an outline sp specifying these individual areas of response from the survey and then have one meeting or maybe one or two meetings in each town um, that's structured using this outline, which we develop and give to all of the board members for their individual. Um, it'd be like an agenda for the meeting, not just an open, okay, so we're listening. What, what do you have to say? We would go through the outline item by item and ask for comments on each one of those items. Kind of a hybrid between Matt's idea and the listening tour. Thank you. No, that's helpful structural ideas. Thank you, Bob. Anybody else? Thanks, everybody. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. Now we're going to move into um, resignations and retirements. And the first person on our list is Megan Badusky, a Killington Elementary School teacher. And I'm wondering if yeah, Ma uh, Mary would like to say something. Oh, wait, I'd like to say, I want to do before Mary does because hers will be better. <laughs> so I do want to say when I saw the come across on Friday, the seven steps of grief started. And uh -huh. seeing my name on there was she was at Barnard, she came over to KES, she taught my two oldest. Um, so we had her for three years in a row because she moved up with the grade, um, very much part of the family post COVID. She was before school with my daughter after school with another daughter. Um, and this is a sad, I'm very sad, but as a working mom, I understand the conflict. I get it. I just hope that there's, she understands that she will be welcomed back with open arms when she's ready to come back. She will be missed. Now, Mary, you can go back. Okay, well, it's hard, hard to follow up on that. She is an exceptional teacher of literacy, particularly writing conventions. She just absolutely loves to teach writing to young children. And when you go into her classroom, when she's in the middle of it, the kids are so engaged. Um, she, she's just exceptional at it. Uh, I, I especially appreciate how she knows all of her students. Um, and she develops relationships with her students and and her colleagues uh, based on integrity and the, and everybody knows it and feels it. Um, so when Megan takes on a project or an initiative, she gives it 110%. And so she's decided to give her new family member 110% of her time. Mm -hmm. and um, And that new family member is going to arrive any day now. So uh, and speaking on behalf of everybody at KES, um, you know, we feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to collaborate with her. Uh, she's been a tremendous asset and contributor to our work with students. And we wish her all the best as she grows her family. And we hope our paths do cross again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Katie and Mary. Um, and uh, so that was a resignation. 
and Karen Payne, elementary PE teacher. I you sure like to thank Karen Payne for her two years of service. The two things that stick out to me is uh, she brought uh, gymnastics back to PE in fifth and sixth grade, as well as uh, she brought the entire school um, to participate in cross country skiing. So it's great that we have ski runners and that students have an opportunity to, to learn how to head downhill. Um, but she was able to work with some community uh, networks and bring all of the students uh, out with an opportunity to learn how to cross country ski as well. So we appreciate her two years and in particular those two things she brought and talked about. Thank you. Um, and Johnny Trudeau, I assume, is, is resigning. Darren, would you like to speak to him? Yes. Yeah, right. Trudeau for Mr. Trudeau. Um, Mr. Trudeau joined Woodstock Union High School Middle School three years ago uh, with a really immensely challenging assignment, which is rebuilding the band program out of the shambles of the pandemic. So to bring that back. And he really had great success. Um, he's built our bands back up to full capacity. Uh, he's performed bands and done well at several competitions. Uh, our pet band is out with crowds at the football games and basketball games, which is an exciting addition he's done. And say in general, Mr. Trudeau has been a positive presence on campus uh, in many ways. He's been in our musicals, he's supported students doing the assemblies, and he's had his middle school jam band, which is pretty amazing to kind of pull back to our rock out from Trudeau with that group. So he's been great. He's moving on to Manchester, New Hampshire with his partner, who is going to be in the National Guard Band. So um, music, new music ventures for him. So thank you, John Trudeau. Thank you. Um, Audrey Richardson, I'm not sure somebody from the okay, administration. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, here's what I say for Audrey. Only a few people have worn as many hats at Woodstock Union High School and Middle School as Audrey Richardson. She has served our school as a teacher, an instructional coach, an interventionist, uh, testing coordinator, and the MTSS coordinator. Um, for years, Audrey, Jennifer Settle, and I have had a semi annual meeting of trying to comprehend her job description and try to find uh, some coherence and, and trick it in some ways. But we never could trick it down. Um, but we did come to really understand how skilled Audrey is at developing systems to support kids. And what I say here is thankfully, this has been the focus of her work for the last few years because she's leaving the school better able to gather and coordinate data, uh, build effective support strategies, and serve students through a well-developed and comprehensive multi-tiered system of support. And that's really a big piece. And so that's a significant task, and it's going to have really lasting impacts on the school. So big thanks to Audrey for that work. She's been in the school for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. I remember she started with us. She graduated for St. Mike's. I remember uh, Mrs. Harpster, who's no longer with us, hired her. And Audrey was a waitress at Ben Bentley's. Yeah. And she just jumped right into being a freshman English teacher and just has worked with us all these years, took some time off to have children, got her PhD, and will be working with you uh, to uh, continue to teach for UVM as well as some other programs. So she's grown up with us. Yeah, miss her. And Colleen Con O'Connell is retiring, and I'd like to say something. Yeah, first I about her. <laughs> Colleen and I since the day she came to Woodstock taught side by side in the language way. And uh, we were true partners in crime, rebels without a cause, or maybe we did have a cause sometimes. Um, but Colleen, and little known fact is Colleen grew up on the North shore of Boston. I grew up on the South shore of Boston. And we were born a day apart, mm -hmm. celebrating our birthdays at the end of this week. And um, so when I saw the letter, I knew it was coming pretty much because she had told me uh, she had to do the same thing I was doing, which is also retiring at the end of this year, finally. And um, I just want to say she's a brilliant person. She is an unbelievable thinker. She is a big picture person. And I was much, a much more of a small picture person. So the two of us would sit down to brainstorm a, a language uh, teaching unit. And she'd have, you know, one of these whiteboards that has 65 arms. And I'm like, okay, which of the four are we actually going to be able to do? And then together we would do these, um, what we thought were brilliant teaching units. Um, but not only that, she's just a great person. She'll do anything for anybody. And she's a uh, down to earth person and uh, just a wonderful educator. And I know she'll keep educating. She just won't be doing it inside the building, so. Thank you, Gary. Now I'm going to add to that too, because Colin will get a huge presence in the building. So here's what I said about Colin O'Connell. First of all, it's fitting that we recognize Colleen and her impact on our school because she's in France right now. 
exposing another group of students to the wonders of engaging with cultures and places different from one's own. In our quest to globalize our rural central Vermont school, Colin has taken hundreds of students on trips like this one and brought hundreds of students from Spain to the Grand Star community. Over the past two years, she has established ongoing relationships and vertical exchanges between our students and students throughout the French uh, diaspora. She is trained to become a highly effective facilitator and rich, challenging dialogue to promote understanding and diminish ignorance across international boundaries. This is really important to Colin. She's doing these exchanges not about do you have a dollar with food duty, but rather how do you deal with women's issues? Uh, what are human rights like in your place? And these are rich dialogues with um, people in Indonesia, Lebanon, and across the face of the diaspora. These accomplishments may lead us to assume that making global connections is her passion. But she has told me throughout our long time together, and what her students experience every day is that her passion is about joy. For more than 20 years, Colin McConnell has brought joy to our school in many ways. From dancing during lessons to playing guitar and singing with students at school assemblies. But well, remember, most is the joy of learning. She radiates every day in the classroom. This is the special thing that Carrie was talking about, just this radius of joy. Uh, she's truly one of a kind, and I really wish her the best. Very tired. Okay. Um, we need to accept the resignation. So somebody would like to make a motion to accept all of them. I'll make a motion to accept them. And uh, second. So Thank you. All in favor of accepting with regret these resignations, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any opposed? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for the kind words. Um, now we're going to go into our committees. Um, the Finance Committee, do you have a presentation? No presentation, just an update. We met on the 18th. Um, much of our kickoff agenda for the year was deferred. We tabled it uh, to go into an executive session, but um, we'll meet again and we will take another break next time. Okay. Um, Elliot, you're going to report on policy and then I'm just going to step up for a minute. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yes, so policy, we have three policies to discuss. Uh, we have uh, two policies for the second reading. The first is the C9, which is the local uh, wellness policy. Um, and this is presented again. We did do some changes from, the, as this is second read, uh, there was this discussed last time we changed uh, in the goals for physical education, we sort of um, clarified where um, the statutes are coming from that are recommending um, sort of the timing on physical ed. We did discuss um, some other options and we decided to go uh, with what the state is, uh, is basically mandating. So we did that. And then um, there's another spot that we added where other school-based activities to promote, we added some text in there. So um, at this point, I would like to ask a motion to adopt this at the next meeting. So this is second meeting. Is there a motion to adopt at the next three or at the next meetings? Sorry. Uh -huh. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Yeah. Aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Okay. Next one is the uh, F20 fiscal management and general uh, financial accountability. Again, this is the second reading. Again, just a, the idea is that it outlines uh, lawful and transparent management of financial affairs. Um, and just to clarify, this does include F21. So as part of this motion, I would ask that, um, that we accept this uh, for adoption at the next meeting, just as we did with the other one, but we also eliminate F21 at the same time because we don't need F21. It's incorporated into this policy. So moved. Second. Oh, Aye. 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 And the, uh, the last one is a first read on capitalization of assets. And basically, this is just a protocol for auditing, recording, and appropriately depreciating all our capital assets. Been, it's been reviewed by Jim Fenn, and I'm asking for a motion to approve it for a second reading next month. So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, buildings and grounds, do you have a presentation tonight or an update? Um, I'll give a quick update. 
it's not a presentation. We we met on March 18th. Um, the the heating conversion project at the high school is nearly con completed. Uh, there are two small wall units that need to be installed. Uh, we had a, a pretty long discussion about our vendor JCI that's installing the uh, Metasys, which is the temperature control system across all the campuses. And um, when when they were approached with with our position that um, we we wanted to uh, essentially you know use all um, means under the contract to 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 find someone else to do the work. Um, they they asked to have until May first to complete the the project. So the buildings and ground committee asked um, Joe and and um, Jim to to get that in writing from JCI so that if they don't deliver uh, the system by May first, um, we could then go into um, what what is the other step under the contract, which is mediation. And if mediation doesn't work, then Potentially litigation. So, um, I think oh, all in all, the the committee was supportive of that approach. That they're going to do their best to get it done by May first. Um, we we talked about some needs to find additional money in our budget in 2025. So we looked at all the projects that were underway, looking to see if we could maybe free up another 50k for other work across the district. Um, we started prioritizing some projects for fiscal year 2026, including some security upgrades for the buildings. Um, and then lastly, probably the most important for this discussion right now is that we did pass a motion uh, directing uh, Joe to, to work with the administration on uh, putting in place uh, emergency repair fund that would go into the 2026 budget. And we've proposed that that fund um, that that reserve that we set up um, that we contribute five percent of the district's operating budget each year, uh, and and the concept here is that if we don't build a new building, um, we need to prepare for the possibility of a of a catastrophic failure, and we need some money put aside to to address that, um, and and then lastly, uh, we did go over some alternatives of how we would educate students if the building failed. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done on that, so I don't have results to share at this point, but we've looked at um, whether we could bring some mobile um, units on, uh, on into the parking lot, whether we could find other places to operate the, the, the school. Uh, that's it from buildings and ground. Thank you, Matt. Anna, did you have a question? I do, yeah. Uh, Matt, I've had a couple of folks approach me about the condition of the driveway at Reading Elementary, specifically the pavement. Um, is that on your radar or is that something that I should contact Joe about? Oh, I can answer the question. Yeah, it's in, I think it's in this 2025 budget, so go ahead, Joe. Brilliant, thanks. Yeah, uh, we'll be starting uh, hopefully as soon as school gets out. We'll have a new parking lot uh, by the end of August. Awesome. Thank you all so much. All right, thank you. Um, are there any working groups? New bills have been covered. Negotiations will have an update during executive session. Okay, uh, we have to approve the minutes from the March 11th meeting. I approve. Okay, so approve. Josh has made a motion to approve. Is there a second? second? Thomas, I think that's a second. Uh, all in favor of approving, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Good. Thank you. And then I think that was all one big group. Yes. All right. We do have Carrie, another. Oh, can, I, yes. uh, can I just ask, uh, do we still have student representatives in the uh, room? And if they yes. have any update on um, any student moves to uh, assess the mascot? Uh, well, that is something we talked about. Our um, goal was to, with the um, the mascot, we were going to kind of like push that lead with uh, the passing of the bond vote, which didn't happen. So we're kind of taking a new approach now. 
um, social action club. We're trying to get everybody together. Um, just the schedule and the way our like our times are free periods work where clubs usually happen. It's uh, difficult, um, kind of all over the place right now, but we're trying to get um, students in to get ideas going. At the moment, I don't think there's a very set in stone plan for the direction we're going to take now with the mascot. I mean, oh, you might know um, more than I do, but I think that right now our goal is to get everybody together to um, discuss, you know, among other things on the agenda for the uh, social action club, um, that the mascot being one of them and also kind of the pool and other groups. I know the configuration and rolling group was working a little bit on that too. So kind of bringing everybody together um, I think will be the next steps. Yeah, I think that's going to be a project uh, mainly for the spring. Um, and uh, I think we and, and the social action club recognize that it's a it's a touchy and sensitive uh, subject on all sides, like the bond vote, and uh, is only complicated by the bond vote uh, temporarily not passing. So uh, I think we'll we'll be spearheading that through the configuration and enrollment working group, um, and then working in tandem with the social action uh, club and and all the other student leadership mechanisms at the school in the next few months. Okay. Um uh let me know if you need some help getting the configuration and enrollment work group back together again thank you awesome. thanks y'all very wise okay um i think at this time we have an opportunity for public comment if there's anybody who would like to um express a concern or make a comment on anything they've heard this is your opportunity Speaking as a member of the public, I am fully in favor of junior privileges. I think junior is working. Really, really hard. I cannot do it. Yeah, that's the next, please. Anybody on the Zoom? Also speaking as the public, if junior privileges get enforced, I want to um, not have the Saturday detention I got for skipping as a junior. <laughs> <laughs> that I actually spent with Carrie, if I remember correctly. <laughs> All right, I think that we, we need somebody to make a motion for executive sentence. <laughs> John, all all favor say aye. Aye. Okay. aye. A couple minute break, please. <laughs> and I would like somebody to make a motion to approve the uh, negotiation settlement. So moved. All second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Well, thank you very much. I will report to the uh, teacher negotiation team that um, the board has approved the settlement offer on the table. Okay, um, now we can reflect. <laughs> We have trouble sometimes with reflecting, so let's let's try to reflect a little bit better. Anyone is welcome to offer anything they'd like to say in reflection. Covered a lot tonight. You did, sure. I I'd have to say that the report that you shared with us, Sherry, was really interesting and had a lot in it. I'm going to go back and reread it. Because there's a lot more that you know, as as you were going through it, it it uh, it was really impressive in many ways. It showed the growth in the last five years. I was really glad that you gave Cody the opportunity to speak on some really important work, mm -hmm. and I was reflecting then that the quality of the interactions with the students and middle school teachers in that work, I think it's also reflected in what students see and the interactions and the civility of this group. I think it's. Makes me proud to be part of both of those. Yeah, I think it's awesome with a daughter in sixth grade now going into seventh. I'm excited that she's doing and her peers are going to get that, you know, sort of focus attention. Area. It's like kind of just, I mean, 
it starts in elementary school, but you know, the shifts that you start seeing you, you know, right around that age, it's so important to, to have that reinforced with, you know, mutual respect and not putting each other down. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody else? Yeah, I'd like, like to give give kudos to Ben and, and Carrie and Bryce for all that work you did on the survey. Unbelievable. Thank you. It was quite the interesting reading. <laughs> I read all the yeses first. <laughs> I was feeling really good, and then I read all the no's. <laughs> I couldn't I take I all the names at once. I had go back scotch. But yes, I did. I just want to say I like the way that we as a group can evolve ideas and build off of each other in a respectful and constructive way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. I have is, a potential go ahead. suggestion. Go ahead. Um Maybe maybe when we have a lot of time scheduled appointments, we encourage the central office staff to uh, keep their presentations to a certain time limit. Just like when Jim and um, Raf and Shana and Jen present the paragraphs that they've inserted in the board book, maybe we keep that abbreviated since we know these meetings go long and we have a lot of lot of work on the agenda. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. I'll second. Hey, okay, Josh. And, uh, all right. And who's is the clerk writing this down? Yeah. Great. Good job. All right. Thank you, everybody. We are adjourned.